Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was the bodyguard of Azula. Naruto is banished from Konoha, but gives them the slip and boards a ship. Soon after, he is shipwrecked on Ember Island and is saved by Azula. Three years later, Naruto is Azula's bodyguard while she hunts for the Avatar, but did he see the last of Konoha? Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 37, Practicing and Wondering. Location, The Treehouse Lobby. Azula walked down into the lobby of the hotel. Thank Agni for similar looking foods. She thought to herself. The food for breakfast still looked a little odd to her, but she managed to make her way through it without causing emergency runs to the bathroom. Azula, over here. Called out To from where she was standing with Aang, Katara, Suki, and Momo, who sat on Aang's shoulder. Good morning, everyone, she greeted as she walked over to them. Morning, Azula. Aang chirped. He was chipper than ever. Do we have any idea of what to do today? The former princess of the Fire Nation asked the rest of the group, looking at them and trying to ignore the Avatar's happy attitude. Not really. Katara answered. We'll have to find a way to pass the time for a month. And we can't go see the guys in that entire time. Toph noted. So, we're on our own. Has Fanning been fed? Azula asked. The cooks took care of him and Appa. Suki told her. I kept an eye on them. It was almost funny to watch. They were more afraid of getting close, close to the dragon than the sky bison. The dragon does look more intimidating. Yeah, but they know what a dragon looks like. They have no idea what a sky bison looks like or what it eats. The Kyoshi warrior said with a smirk on her face. I think the fact that they had to give Hei to Appa tipped them off. She replied in complete deadpan. You know what I think we should do. Tof said aloud, getting everyone's attention. What? Katara asked. I think we should train Twinkle Toes while we're here. What? You mean right now? Well, we would have to find a more suitable spot. She said sarcastically. She does have a point. Azula agreed. Just because we're here for a month does not mean we should slack off. Okay, so where should we train? Aang asked. He couldn't think of a place to train in bending inside the village. We'd have to find a place, Aang. Suki pointed out. We can go looking once Appa's done eating. No. Azula declared, seeing what he was trying to do. We don't need Appa, we'll walk. What? Why? He immediately asked. He didn't see anything wrong with using Appa. Aang, we're in a village. Katara pointed out to him. We really don't need to fly around. We didn't do that when we first got here. Oh, right. He said with a sheepish grin. Sorry, I forgot. One would think that you were raised by a sky bison the way you keep using Appa. Azula remarked. He said nothing in reply as they left the hotel. Location, Jiraiya's training ground. You are a fucking sadist. Naruto accused Jiraiya as he, Sokka, and Zuko lay on the ground, wheezing for their existence. Akela was doing the same, just with a little more dignity. That was because your attempts were disgraceful. He practically bellowed at them. You, ex you expect us to climb a waterfall with a load of rocks on our backs while dodging Kanai and Shuriken. Saka demanded. He had felt he was going to fall off at any moment and had a few times. Yes, I do. And if the three of you do not get up right now, I will double your loads. Can I ask why exactly I'm carrying five times the load they are? Naruto demanded, pointing at said load on his back as they all stood back up. You're a former shinobi, you can deal with it. Now get moving. He pulled out a kunai. If you're not moving before I count to three, 
I am not pulling you out of the water. 1. They got the point and ran for the waterfall that showered water into the shallow, rocky creek. This is for your own good. If you want to get through the final exam, then you have to do everything I tell you. We still hate you. They shouted at him. What a big surprise. He remarked sarcastically. Now get climbing. Location, Aang's group. They wandered through the village, having left Momo with Appa and Fan Ng. People glanced at them but didn't really say anything. You know, I'm kinda glad we're here. Aang remarked as they walked down the street. People don't see me as the avatar here. They just think I'm a normal kid. A normal kid would have hair on the top of his hair and no arrow tattoo on it either. Tof remarked, making the others laugh. It's a part of my culture. He protested. In case you haven't noticed, this is not a place of your culture. Suki told him. They weren't anywhere near an air temple. Aren't we supposed to be looking for a place to practice? Azula asked pointedly. How about we use the space over there? Tof suggested as she pointed to her left. Their gazes followed her finger. Ah, uh, Tof? Said Katara once she saw what the blind earthbender was pointing at. That's a fence. I mean what's beyond the fence, Katara. There's a big field there, and it's completely empty. So long as we don't get over-destructive and hit the build building, we'll be fine. She walked over to the fence and leapt over it. Suki looked at the others. Can we think of anything else? Probably not, Azula admitted. We might as well go with it. She followed Toph's example and jumped over the fence. Katara, Suki, and Aang followed. Well, it certainly has the room. Aang remarked as he looked around. It does look like a training area. It was big, flat, and had nothing that could be an obstacle in the way. So, how do we want to do this? Katara asked. We test his ability with each element. Tof stated. Since we don't have another airbender, Suki can take care of that. Not a problem. Suki agreed. We go in the cycle Aang learned. Once the next person feels like it, they'll step in and take over the fight. Azula said. Anyone have a problem with that? No. Aang answered. So, who's going to start? Me. Suki answered, just before charging him. Although it caught him by surprise, he quickly recovered. She charged forward and threw a set of punches at him. He twisted and turned, staying out of the path of the punches. Seeing an opportunity, he got around her and placed his hand on her back. The idea was that no matter how she turned, he turned with her. However, she had trained with him before, so she knew how to get out of the predicament. She suddenly dropped low and tried to sweep his legs out from under him. He leapt back to avoid falling to the ground. She followed him by turning around and rolling forward. As she came out of the roll, she snapped her feet out into a kick at his knees. Once she saw that he took a step back to avoid it, she followed through with the kick by standing up. Come on, Aang, she told him. You're supposed to be air bending at me, not dodging. Sorry. Sorry, it's a part of the air bending training. I'm not trying to hurt you. He apologized. Don't worry about hurting me, just use your air bending. Right, he answered. She came at him again, this time using kicks as well as punches. Aang started off slow. He used his air bending to make her punches or kicks miss slightly. Then he began to indirectly attack her. He pressed forward but always kept moving around. This allowed him to distract her while also sending blasts of air at her. It forced her to give ground so she wouldn't be hit by the air blasts. He took that advantage and began to use air swipes via his staff. If he ever gets the attitude to able to kill, those air swipes of his will be deadly. She thought to herself as she was forced to bend backwards to avoid an aforementioned swipe. She tried to turn the fight back to her advantage by getting in close. 
He responded by bending the air to lift her up off the ground and pushing her quickly recovered and charged back at him. The charge was cut off when she had to start dodging air blasts and swipes again. She was forced to hop from one side to the other, slowing her down. How are you doing? Aang asked her as he kept bending the air at her. Why are you asking me that? She asked back. We're in the middle of training. I don't know, just because? Please don't. Tell me this isn't a habit of yours. She rolled out of the air he was bending at her. But he followed and she was forced to keep hopping. Well, no. But you're my friend, not my enemy. Why shouldn't I talk to you? Because you should be focusing on your opponent, Katara told him. And not talking to your friends. She bent the water out of her pouch and threw it at him. As he caught it and threw it back, Suki stepped back out of the fight. Katara caught the water, split it in half and threw both at him. He redirected one back at her but kept one for his own use. He then bent the water he kept into a water whip and swung it at her. She blocked it with her own water whip. She pressed forward, swinging the water whip at his feet. He fell back, dodging the whip. Seeing an advantage, she threw the whip at him and froze it, turning it into a spear of ice. He managed to catch the spear in his own water and sent it back in a deluge. She didn't move fast enough and was sent flying into a tree. She did however manage to melt the ice spear in the water before it pierced her. She was dazed from the hit, but the advantage was with her. Aang had thrown all his water at her and left himself with none. Realizing his mistake, he tried to bend some of the water back to himself. But Katara had managed to shake herself out of her daze. She bent most of the water back to her, but he managed to grab some of it. However, if you were to compare the amount of water either of them had, she had the bigger amount. This almost feels like when I fought Master Paku. She thought to herself. Only I'm not the student. It was true. If she gave it her all, she could easily beat Aang in waterbending. But the last time she tried to give it her all was when she was hunting Yonareche, so she wasn't really going to give it her all. She bent the water into a wall in front of her. She plunged her hands into the wall and then withdrew them. She froze the water on her fingers into claws of ice. Swinging one arm, she fired the claws at him. He avoided them by rolling to the side. She threw the other set of claws at him. As he came out of the roll, he leapt straight up into the air to avoid the second set. The small amount of water which he had carried through the roll, the roll was now circling his waist. As he landed, he bent the water into a whip and used it to block further sets of ice claws thrown at him. This exchange went on for quite a bit. Katara would throw ice claws and the occasional ice spear at him. He would use the water whip to either knock the ice aside or deflect it back at Katara, who either dodged or caught it effortlessly. As it went on, Katara began to lose the water she had. The deflected ice was scattered all around them. Some had hit trees, others had hit the ground, and a small number had hit the nearby building. Thankfully, none of it had pierced the windows, otherwise the training session would have ended shortly afterwards. Finally, she couldn't keep throwing ice at him due to the low amount of water she had left. He had tried to outpace her and succeeded. The amount of water they had changed, he now had the bigger amount. But before he could do anything, he had to duck in order to avoid a rock aimed at his head. My turn, Toph declared. Katara acted swiftly and snagged Aang's water away from him as she stepped back. Aang quickly assumed an earthbending stance. He struck first by trying to off-balance her. He bent the earth beneath her upwards into a column and then destroyed the column. Toph fell back to the ground. She recovered and then bent a rock line at him. As the line reached him, she bent rock column to jut out at him. He threw a spinning kick at them, breaking them apart. The rubble surrounded him, and he took advantage of that. He sent a barrage of rocks at her. She defended herself by knocking the rocks to the ground. After she had reduced the last rock to dust with a punch, she bent two rocks of her own and threw them at him. 
he bent up a wall from the ground to protect himself from the rocks. Once they had smashed into it, he sent pieces of the wall at her, almost like what she did at the earth rumble. She sidestepped one piece, leapt over the second and swatted the third away, smashing it to pieces. He bent a column out of the ground, but it wasn't for protection. Starting from the bottom, he bent discs of rock at her. She tried to stop them by bending a wall up, but the first disc smashed through the wall, and the others followed. She was forced to keep moving, if she tried to block one of the discs, the weight would probably send her flying. After he was done with the column, he bent the remains into an earth gauntlet that covered his right hand. He charged forward at her. He drew back the gauntlet into a punch. But that was what she was waiting for. As the punch flew at her, she grabbed hold of it and bent it down to the ground, taking him with it. He hit the ground and the gauntlet shattered, spraying bits of rock everywhere. She tried to send him flying by jutting a column underneath him. But even though he had hit the ground and was a little dazed, he managed to recover and roll out of the way. Seeing him roll away, she bent a rock from nearby and threw it hard at him. He covered himself in a sphere of rocks, protecting himself from the rock. Once it had smashed against the sphere, he broke it apart and sent it at her in a deluge of rock and dirt. As it was about to hit her, she plunged her hands into it and split it apart. The two parts of the deluge were bent around her and slammed into the ground behind her. They stared at each other, a little worn but still good to go. They waited for the other to make the first move. That's weird. He thought. Toph's not really the one to wait in a fight. He then noticed that she had a slight smile on her face. It was that smile that warned him. He leapt back to avoid the fireball that flew through the space where his head previously was. I guess you're up now? He asked Azula. She didn't answer him. She just bent another fireball at him. He blocked it with his own fireball. As Toph stepped away, they circled each other. Azula moved first by dropping low and swiping her leg, sending a low wave of fire at him. He blocked by bending his own fire to disrupt it. He turned in a circle and bent a blast of fire at her head. She spun to the side, bending out a fire whip and swinging it at him. He swatted it aside with his own fire whip. After exchanging a few blows with the whips, Aang took his and threw it in a fire blast at her. She deflected it, sending it upwards and quickly sent her own fire blast at him. He bent his fire into the form of a shield to block the blast. He was successful, but he skidded backwards as well. She pressed forward and bent her fire into the shape of daggers. She got in close to him and started to swing. He tried to attack back, but her strikes kept him from doing so. He was forced to duck and weave while she used her fire daggers. He finally got the chance when she left herself open after a particular strike. He moved around and bent a fire blast at her back. Seeing what he was doing, she lifted her foot up and knocked his hands aside, sending the blast away. She then spun around on one foot and bent a fire arc at him. He jumped back in a flip to avoid the arc. As he was airborne, he thrust his feet out into a kick, bending fire at her. Not only did it stop her from attacking, it gave him some extra push to land further away. When she saw the fire coming at her, she split it into two and slammed them into the ground on either side of her. He landed away from her. Just as his feet touched the ground, she sent another low fire wave at him. He threw himself into a backflip to avoid the wave, and then bend a fire arc at her with his leg. She disrupted the fire by kicking her leg at it, splitting it in half and making it dissipate in the air. They stared at each other for a brief minute. They then did the exact same thing. They bent a stream of fire at the other person. The streams collided and thus the struggle to push the other one back began. It was something to see. Blue fire fought with orange. One would look like it was devouring the other for a brief moment before pushed back. At one point, Azula would have the upper hand. The next, Aang would have it. Eventually, the streams died down and they were left panting lightly. Okay, I think we're good. Aang said. 
Not yet, Twinkle Toes. Toph said. There's one more thing we have to do. What's that? He asked, turning to face her. She just grinned and shouted four on one. She, Katara, Azula and Suki all charged him at the same time. The idea was to see how he would do against multiple benders and a non-bender at the same time. However, before they could even start attacking, they heard someone say a hem. Stopping, they all turned to see who said that. They saw a man with tan skin, brown hair he wore in a ponytail, dark eyes and a scar across his nose. He wore the Kanoha Shinobi uniform, which was blue pants and a blue shirt, along with the green flak jacket and the headband around his forehead. Hello, my name is Iraka Yumano. I'm an instructor at the Kanoha Academy. He greeted them. May I ask what exactly are you doing the Academy's backyard? He asked while fiddling with a kunai. The threat was all but screaming in the silence. They looked around and saw that despite their efforts not to go overboard, they had torn up the place rather impressively. The yard was a complete and utter mess. They then looked up and saw that at every window, kids were looking out and watching them. Um, oops. Offered a sheepish ang. Location, Jiraiya's training ground. He stared at the bodies lying around. You all should just give up right now and save yourselves the trouble of losing in the final exam. Told them with disappointment in his voice. Now get up. Can we please have a moment to lie here in pain? Saka asked pleadingly. Akela, who was lying on his side, whined in agreement. Moments over up. They struggled to get back up. Although their bodies protested, they managed to get into a sitting position. Now tell me, where did you all go wrong just now? I don't know. Why don't you enlighten us? Naruto asked sarcastically. Jiraiya's response was to smack him in the back of the head. Ow. Oh. What was that for? I asked you all a serious question, and you decided to be a smartass about it. The Toad Sage told him. You told us to attack you and we did, only to get thoroughly beaten to a pulp. Zuko answered. Wrong. He shouted at them. If they had the energy, they would have leapt back. I told you to attack me as a group. Instead, you all attacked me as individuals. We did come at you as a group. Naruto told him. We attacked you at the same time. And that's all you did. He roared. When one person tried to attack me, the others would back off so they wouldn't interfere. I can't believe you went with it. He glared at Naruto. The blonde should have known better than that. Hey, if this was a battlefield, I'd been doing something different than staying back. The fire paragon retorted. This is a battlefield. If you want to survive the final exam, each and every one of you must be able to fight in tandem with each other. But I thought that the final exam was fought one-on-one. -on -one. Saka said. You can never be too sure. Now, try attacking me again. With no warning, he lunged at them. They rolled back away from him, grabbing their blades off the ground. What? No warning? Naruto asked as they stood up. I thought you, you knew that you didn't get any warnings in the real world. He looked at them as they moved into their stances, Akela bared his teeth. I hope swords aren't the only things in your arsenal. They looked at each other and nodded once. Saka pulled out his boomerang. Zuko heated the edges of his Dao swords with his fire bending. Naruto created three more clones and they all moved into a different bending form. Better, but I'm still not impressed. Then let us impress you. Zuko said as they all charged at him. Location, Aang's group. After apologizing several times, Aang and the others tried to repair the backyard. Tof, that's the last time we let you pick the place to train. Katara told her as she bent the water and ice scattered around back into her pouch, melting the ice as she went. I know, I know. Tof replied as she and Aang mended the earth, 
putting rocks back in the ground and putting the remnants of the walls and columns back down into the ground. Pardon me if I thought it was just a random building and not where they teach the kids. Some of those kids are the same age as you and Ain. Azula remarked drilly as she put the small fires that had fallen to the ground. You really can't call them kids. Have they gone through the same things we have? No. Then I can call them kids as much as I like. She declared defiantly. She's got you there. Suki commented to Azula. Shut up. In any case, we're all done here. Aang stated. The backyard was more or less back to the way it was. Let's go find that instructor and tell him. They walked back into the academy. They climbed the stairs up to the second floor and walked to his room. However, they ran into him in the hallway, him and his class. Hey, we're done out there. Tof told him, pointing her thumb behind her. She was about to say something else when the class swarmed them. That fight was so cool. One girl squealed. You guys were so awesome. Another told them. Hey, can you show me how to use fire like that? One boy asked Azula. Azula. Please teach me how to move rocks like you did. Another begged Tof. Show us your moves. Someone told Suki. Irika whistled loudly, getting everyone's attention. That's enough, class. He told them. Now give them some room. The kids did so reluctantly. Thank you for doing that. It was our mess. Azula replied. Therefore, we had to clean it up. Well, at least you admit it. That's something I can honestly say some of my students won't do. He looked back at the class, making some of them take a keen interest in the wall. So, how do you like Kanoha so far? It's very nice. Katara answered honestly. We've looked around since we've come here. There are so many things to see. The air feels so clean and fresh around here. Aang commented. I haven't felt that in a while. That's good to know. Irika replied. Was there anything you wanted to know about our village? Well, we have been wondering about the faces up on the mountain. Suki told him. But we haven't really bothered to ask anyone about them. Then you're in luck. He declared with a smile. We were about to go talk about the pervious Hokages. Would you like to come with us? We would be honored. Azula answered. Lead the way. All right then, follow me. He walked down the hall, the students followed him, and then they did. They left the academy and walked over to the Hokage building. They made their way through the building before finally climbing up to the roof. Irika had the students sit down while Aang and the others stood at the back. Is everyone here? He asked. Everyone answered in the affirmative. Good. Now, as most of you know, behind me is the Hokage Mountain. On it are the faces of the Hokages. From left to right, they are the Shodame Hokage, Naidame Hokage, Sandame Hokage, Yandame Hokage and finally, the Godame Hokage. One student raised her head. Who is the Rokadame Hokage, Irika sensei She asked. Before before he could answer the student, someone else did. What? Do I have to retire already? They all turned around to see Tsunade standing at the stairs. In her arms was a small pig wearing a red jacket and collar of pearls. I've only been the Hokage for about three years, have I really been doing that bad of a job? La Lady Hokage! Squeaked the girl. No, no. You've been doing a great job. Now you're just buttering me up before telling about some bad habits I have. No, I wasn't. I swear. This only made her laugh. Lady Tsunade, could you please not tease my students? Irika asked her. Just having a little fun, Irika, she told him, the grin on her face making her look like she was a mischievous young girl. The pig looked up at her and oinked. 
All right, Taunton, I'll stop. She looked back at Irika. So, giving a history lesson? Yes, Lady Tsunade. What brings you out here? He asked her. I'm taking a small break from the paperwork, so I figured I'd come up here and get some fresh air. You've come at a good time. Would you like to join us? Eh, why not? She walked forward and stood next to him. As you know, Lady Tsunade is the Godame Hokage. He told his students and visitors. She is a part of the Sanin and renowned for her strength and her medical skills. She is also the holder of the Slug Summoning Contract and because of this, is known as the Slug Princess of Kanoha. As the students looked at her with wonder and amazement, Azula looked with curiosity. How is she qualified to be Hokage? She asked aloud, getting everyone's attention. Did you not listen to what Irika just said? Toph asked her. Yes, I'm well aware of what she can do, Toph. But there are many people here who are probably just as skilled as her or possibly better. So how did she get the position as the village leader over the others? Mainly because the other candidate refused when he was told and then offered to go get me. Tsunade told her drilly. But you do have a point. What qualifies me to be the Hokage? She looked over at Irika. He got the point and began to explain. While Lady Tsunade is a renowned shinobi and medic, those are not the only things that contributed to her being Hokage. Another important factor is her lineage. Her lineage? Repeated Aang, a little confused. Who your parents were wasn't really a big thing among the air nomads. Yes. Lady Tsunade is the granddaughter of the first Hokage, the grandniece of the second Hokage, and the student of the third Hokage. He explained. Basically, she has the best claim. And that's all there is to it. She walked past the students and back to the stairs, only to stop at the top and look back. Azula, was it? She asked. Yes. She answered. Follow me, please. I want to talk to you. She walked down the staircase and Azula followed. Location, Jiraiya's training ground. Zuko, Sokka, and Naruto were engaged in a free-for-all, using only their swords. They did this while also dodging kunai and shuriken thrown at them by Jiraiya. Agni. Zuko swore as a kunai pierced his thigh. You're too slow, Zuko. Jiraiya told him. I'm fighting at my top speed here. Then you need to be faster. Any slower and a genin fresh out of the academy could beat you. I don't see you doing this. Saka shouted at him as he simultaneously parried one of Zuko's Dao swords and dodging a shuriken. However, he got another shuriken in the arm because of his dodging. You need to be more aware of your surroundings, Saka. The old shinobi shouted at him. I'm trying. Trying isn't good enough. People who try are the ones who fail. How many times have you tired, only to fail? Who asked you? He snarled. The snarl turns to a scream of pain as a kunai embedded itself in his leg. You must, you must focus. If you hadn't lost control of your emotions, you could have avoided that. I hate you with every inch of my being. Heard it before, now focus. The tribesman turned his attention back to the fight. It continued on for a good amount of time. It kept moving around the training ground, due to the fact that a sword fight never stays in one spot, and also Jiraiya kept making them be aware of their surroundings. Finally, Jiraiya stopped throwing things at them. All right, that's enough. He told them. They collapsed to the ground when they heard that, sighs of relief escaping their mouths. Akela padded over to Saka's side and sat down. So, can you tell me what exactly the three of you doing wrong was? We were talking to you while we were fighting. Naruto asked with tried sarcasm. Yes, that is a part of it, but that is not all. Naruto, your ability to fight with a Jin is somewhat sloppy. You're not a master of it, are you? Of course not, it was just something in my arsenal. The blonde replied. 
The Jian master here is Saka. He was more inclined to have the thing lost or destroyed. Maybe he should just stop trying. That's another thing. The toad sage turned his attention to Saka. Saka, while you are able to use your Jian and your boomerang effectively when they're separate, you are horrible at using them together. Hey, I have never seen the reason to use them at the same time. It's usually been one or the other. The water paragon said in explanation. You have to learn how to use them together. There'll come a time when you will have to, and if you don't learn how, you'll end up dead. He turned to Zuko. Zuko, why weren't you using your fire bending in the fight? It would have given you an advantage. You told me not to. He protested. I told you not to use it when it wasn't needed. You took that as not being allowed to use it. This was a sword fight. And your point is? Just because it was a sword fight doesn't mean you have to stick with swords. A sword fight is a fight, and you can use anything that gives you the advantage in a fight. Now what are we going to do? Naruto asked. Climb the waterfall again with stones on our backs? Making us run the entire place 40 times in under 10 minutes? Saka asked. Or is it going to be repeating the same set of movements while standing still for 5 hours? Zuko asked. It's none of those. Jiraiya answered, surprising them. You've been doing a little better than pathetic, but I can't blame you. This is only the first day of your training. He turned away from them. I'm going to get food. You all take a breather. He walked away into the bush. They turned to look at each other. Did I hear him right? Saka asked. I heard our personal torturer say that we could take a breather and relax a bit. Naruto replied. Did I hear wrong? No, I heard it too. Zuko told him. So, we can actually relax for a little. Saka asked for clarification. Not yet. Naruto said. We have to do one more thing. They all raised their arms and looked at what was embedded there. We have to pull these out. They said in unison. Location, Hokage office. Azula stood in front of Tsunade's desk. Well, you wanted to talk to me. She said. What do you want to talk about? Tsunade looked her straight in the eye. What exactly is your relationship with Naruto? She asked. I assume that since Jiraiya was spying on us, he sent you reports. He did. Then why do you want to know about what went on with us? She asked. It's always better to hear from the person than read it off a piece of paper. The Hokage said in reply. I can agree with that. So, what is your relationship with Naruto? She repeated. He is my bodyguard. The former princess of the Fire Nation answered. So, he protects you? That is what a bodyguard does. She replied sarcastically. I suppose you chose him and you two didn't get along well at first? Wrong. He beat me in an Agni Kai and won the right to be my bodyguard. Bodyguard. But you still didn't get along at first, right? It took some time to get used to him being around all the time. She admitted. That and he acted exactly like I remembered him. And what was that? Tsunade asked, sounding curious. Why should I be telling you this? I want to know. She gave an annoyed sigh. He was insufferable, acted smug every time he was proven right, and kept pulling pranks on me just for a laugh. There were days where I wanted to kill him. And yet, he's still alive. The older woman remarked. I guess you began to see something else in him? She slowly nodded. I began to see his good points. He was kind and caring. He never refused to give some of the money he earned to those who desperately needed it. He was friendly to all and only showed his anger to those who deserved it. He kept pulling pranks in order to make me laugh. When he led men into a fight, he always made sure to get every soldier under his command out alive. 
he never bragged about his feats or his strengths. He was someone you could count on. And then you fell in love with him. It would have been hard not to. He changed me. He all but dragged me out of the comfortable place I knew as my life and showed me what was really going on. He made me think about old things in different ways. He forced me to train myself with new things. He had me see things from another's perspective. He changed me and I fell in love with him. She placed her fingers on the necklace around her neck. He even gave me this. That got Tsunade's attention. Let me see that. She ordered her when she saw the necklace. Why should I? That is supposed to be with Naruto. I gave it to him. He's supposed to keep it on at all times. What in the name of the spirits are you talking about? Azula demanded. That necklace belonged to my grandfather. I inherited it and then gave it to Na Naruto. The slug sage reached out her hand. Now give it to me. No. She closed her hand around it, as if to protect it from her. That belongs to Naruto. She stood up from her chair, clearly angry. And Naruto gave it to me as a birthday present. She replied, just as angry. Why would he do something like that if he needed to keep it? Tsunade looked at her, then at the necklace, and then sat back down in the chair. That Baka, she muttered to her quietly. Does he not realize what the necklace is for? Why would he give it to her? Excuse me? Azula asked, having only heard parts of what she was muttering. Never mind, it doesn't concern you. You sound just like him. She said with annoyance. What do you mean? Until we came here, I didn't know much about Naruto's past. He never told us where he came from or why he left, he just kept telling us that it doesn't concern us. We only began to find out about him when your team started to protect the Avatar, and even then, it was just tidbits of information. I see. The Hokage said. That's good. Neither her or the others know about what he holds. She thought to herself. So you love Naruto, but you don't much about him. Yes, I do. What about it? She said nothing. She flashed her hands through a quick number of hand seals, and then placed her hand on her desk. Azula saw a kanji briefly flash on the desk before fading away. Even though nothing in the room, she felt like her ears had been plugged up a little. What was that? Tsunade took her hand away from the desk and leaned back in her chair. What would you say if I told you that after the Chunin exams, I would let Naruto to go back to the bending countries? I would say that there would have to be a catch. She nodded in agreement. What would you say if I told you that I would have the members of the Kanoha 11 here go with you to help? I would say that their help would be unneeded and that they would only hinder, hinder us. Are you sure about that? The Hokage asked her with a raised eyebrow. Yes. I would also say that is not the catch. Azula stated. What would you say if I told you that I would send the Kanoha 11 in order to keep an eye on Naruto, and had orders to make sure he came back to Kanoha willingly? I would say that it would never happen. There was a moment of silence. What would you say if I told that if he refused, they would have orders to subdue him, to bring him back by force and once he was back, the past three years would be wiped from his memory? She became furious and covered her hands in blue fire. I would kill them before that happens. She shouted. And if you gave that order, I will burn you to ashes. After staring her straight in the eyes, Tsunade did something Azula wasn't expecting, she laughed. Kami, I was right about you. What? She stood from the chair. Put the fire, Azula. Remember, I used the words what and if dot. The fire disappeared, but the anger and suspicion in her eyes did not. Explain. She ordered. While there are orders for Naruto to have his memory wiped if he refuses to come back willingly, those orders are never going to happen. She explained. The reason I am telling you this is because I believe that out of the five of your group here in the village, you and Suki are the most level-headed. 
However, you know Naruto better than Suki, so I told you. Told me what? This wasn't making any sense. And she would like it to make sense. I want you to listen closely. She walked around the desk so the two of them stood face to face. The Kanoha 11 members here have been told of these orders. But they think that the orders will be carried out when they are done in the bending countries. So I'll have to kill them before they try it. She growled. That might be true, if they were going. You're not, you're not making sense. She was beginning to get really annoyed by it all. I know I am not. I'm doing that on purpose. The Hokage remarked. What is this all about? I'm telling you this because I want you to keep the rest of your team calm. There is a good chance that they will hear the Kanoha 11 talking about these orders. I need you to make sure they don't think anything of it, and make sure they don't plan anything. Why? If they did, they could ruin the plan. I cannot let that happen. What plan? I can't tell you. I'm sorry. This is shinobi politics, isn't it? She asked, remembering what Naruto told her and the others. Tsunade gave a small smile and nodded quietly. It's often dangerous and deadly. But if you play it right, the rewards are very satisfying. Now, you're going to keep quiet about this conversation, right? Of course, I will. She had been in politics long enough to realize when she had to be quiet. But you do realize that Katara, Aang, and the others are probably trying to listen in through the door? The smile turned into a smirk. After I touched my desk, you felt your ears plugged up slightly, right? Yes. That was the silence seal taking effect. This conversation we just had was one that only the two of us heard. She explained to the firebender. You're sure about that? It seemed a little far-fetched to Azula. Of course I'm sure. It's my office. What will we do now? I am going to deactivate the seal, and you will leave. For all intents and purposes, we just talk about Naruto. I wanted to know how he was during the past three years. Sound good? Yes, it does. She walked back to her chair, placed her hand on the seal spot, and muttered Kai. Azula's ears lost the plugged-up feeling as the silent seal faded away. Thank you for telling me about him, Princess Azula. Tsunade, Tsunade said, acting like nothing had happened. I'm not a princess. She told her. But you're welcome, Lady Hokage. She turned around and walked to the door. She opened it and swung it open. She saw Aang and Katara standing against the wall, with oh-so-innocent smiles on their faces. Didn't anyone tell you it's rude to eavesdrop? She asked. What? We weren't eavesdropping. Aang protested. Of course, you weren't, and I'm the incarnation of Agni. Sorry, Azula, Katara apologized. We couldn't hear anything, so we got curious. So, you were listening in before that. She said, catching them with their own words. Well, no kidding. The boss lady of the village wants to talk to you and you alone, leaving us out here? Of course, they're going to try and listen in. Tof said, cutting them off before they could protest. Lady Tsunade thought the same thing. That's why she gave us some privacy. They began to walk down the corridor. What did she want to talk to you about? Suki asked, genuinely curious. She wanted to know about Naruto. That's it? Aang asked in disbelief. He was a shinobi of this village once. She pointed out. She wanted to know how he's been for the past three years, that's all. Why didn't she ask one of us? Katara asked. She looked her straight in the eyes. Okay, please remember who has known him the best for the better part of three years. She's got you there. Tof said with a laugh. Katara's face flushed for asking something that was completely obvious. We well, now what are we going to do? She asked, trying to change the subject. Suki looked out a nearby window. Why don't we get something to eat? 
she suggested. It's about noon. Yeah, let's go to Ichiraka's. Aang declared. Let's go then. Azula said, shrugging her shoulders. That was all Aang needed to hear, he ran down the corridor so fast he actually left a dust trail. I didn't think Twinkle Toes like that place. Tof said. Don't they have a lot of meats in the food? They have a veggie ramen which he's beginning to love to death. Katara explained. Wait a moment, I thought Aang wasn't carrying the money we were given. Given. Suki said, remembering the money bag the Kanoha Eleven had given them. He's not. Azula told her, pulling the money bag out. We might as well go after him, before he orders anything. They all nodded in agreement and chased after him. Location, Jiraiya's training ground. The sun was setting in the distance. Naruto, Saka and Zuko were sitting around and were the midst of pulling out the kunai and shuriken and wrapping the wounds up. Ah, Agni, that stings. Zuko swore as he wrapped up his arm. I hear that. Saka agreed as he wrapped a bandage around his thigh. Naruto was feeling the same pain they were feeling due to the fact Jiraiya had him stop the QB from healing him. Oh, how I hate that pervert right now. He thought viciously as he wrapped up his hand. Hey, he said you weren't going to miss out on any part of the training. The QB told him. I guess that means the pain part as well. I still hate the pervert. He's a super pervert, remember? Shut up. Well, I think we can all agree on one thing. Saka said aloud for everyone to hear. That our teacher for a month is a sadistic bastard? The blonde asked him. Yes. But there's something else too. And what's that? He's not kidding around. I think that after the month is up, we won't be the same as we were before. They fell quiet as they thought about what he said. It made sense. Jiraiya was definitely trying to kill them, but they were getting stronger. He's still a sadistic bastard. Zuko said. Akela barked in agreement. I'm glad you all hold me in so high esteem. Jiraiya said from behind them. Surprised, they turned around and saw he was carrying a big boar on his back. Is, is that for us? Saka asked, almost drooling at the boar. No. No. This is my dinner. You have to get your own. What? They all shouted at him. They were too tired to actually try and hunt for their own food. His serious face sprouted a huge grin as he threw back his head in laughter. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. There's enough to go around and even though you guys didn't do well today, you deserve this. He dropped the boar to the ground. Now, while I start the fire, you three take care of the boar. He left to gather the sticks for the fire. They got to work skinning the boar. Saka took the lead due to the fact he had done skinning before. Naruto and Zuko followed his orders carefully. By the time Jiraiya had come back, the boar was almost skinned. He set up the fire and then watched as they finished skinning the boar. He took the carcass, put it on a spit and hung it over the fire. He slowly turned the spit, making sure the boar was thoroughly roasted. When he was done, he carved out pieces of the meat and handed them to the team, who fell on the food with the grace and dignity of a pack of wolves, which is ironic, considering Akela was there. This is delicious. Saka declared with tears in his eyes. I have never tasted something so good. So glad you approve. Jiraiya told him. They finished the rest of the meat in silence. So tell me, did you enjoy today's training? He asked them. We hated you every minute of the day. Naruto answered. Good to know, because this is only the first day. We have the rest of the month and I will use that month to make you all better and stronger. Stronger, even if I have to break you down and build you back up. He declared. They shared a look for a long minute and then looked back at him. We might hate it and we definitely hate you for it. Zuko said, speaking for the group. But bring it. 
The toad sage just gave them a vicious grin that promised a lot of work and loads of pain. Chapter 38, Needing and Discovering Location, Hokage Office Tsunade sat at her desk, working her way through the paperwork in front of her. I need a drink. She thought to herself. Her eyes wandered over to the sake bottle at the edge of the desk and the cup next to it. She stretched out her hand to reach for the bottle, only to hear an angry oink come from the other side of the room. Oh, come on, Taunton. She said as she looked at the pig. It's just one drink. Taunton shook her head, walked over to the desk, leapt up onto it and sat in front of the same bottle. She oinked again to emphasize her point. Come on. Please? All she got was an oink again. All I'm asking for is one cup. That's all, I swear. You know, this is why Shizen has her keep an eye on you. Jiraiya said from behind her. She swerved to face him. You better have a good reason for being here, Jiraiya. Otherwise, you're going to end up flying through that window. She threatened him. He raised his hands up in surrender. Easy there, princess. He looked over at the pig. It's all right, Taunton, she can have one drink. The pig nodded once in agreement and walked away from the sake bottle. He walked to the bottle and poured it into a cup. Here you are. This is all you get. He gave her the cup. She took and drowned it in one shot. Give me another. She said, holding up the cup. No, you only get one. You do remember what's happening today, right? Of course, I remember. Why do you think I'm trying to have some sake? That's not funny, Tsunade. It was worth a shot. She glared at the cup in her hand. Besides, I can't remember remember the last time they showed up for the final exam when one of their genin wasn't in it. There is a first time for everything. He remarked. Oh, shut up. They fell silent. The silence lasted for a couple minutes. How are they doing? You've had a month. The Hokage finally asked. They've progressed fairly well. Is that all? He looked at her. If you wanted to ask about Naruto, just say so. Well. She wasn't in the mood to play this game of questions with him. I've pushed him harder than the others. He's taken to it with minimum complaints. And apparently, I have a new nickname, the fucking sadist. That's an old one. She told him, looking back down at her cup. We just called you that behind your back. The toad sage was silent for about three seconds before he spoke again. Well, it's nice to know someone calls me that to my front now. Where are they? Tsunade asked him. Due to what was going on, the only person who knew where they were was her teammate. I left them there and told them to keep training. He replied, not really answering the question. I figured with what is going on today, me being with you will help out in the long run. Will he be able to do it? You know as well as I do how much he hates him. But at the end, if he can't kill him. She left the rest of the sentence hanging, still doubting the blonde could do it. Jiraiya didn't have such problems. Tsunade, he agreed the moment I told him who he was supposed to kill. He'll be able to do it, probably with pleasure. I guess you're right. She finally put the cup down. So, while you're with me, we'll watch them. He turned to look at the pig. Taunton, could you? She shook her head. It's just for a short while. She oinked in the negative. Look, if you're worried about her, don't be. He pointed his thumb at Tsunade. Tsunade. I'll keep an eye on her, promise. She thought it over. After a few minutes, she nodded in agreement. Thank you. Could you come over here for a minute? She walked over to him and allowed him to put a note in her collar. She hopped off the desk and walked through to the open door. All right, pour me another, Jiraiya. Tsunade declared, grabbing the cup. Now that her pig was gone, she could indulge. No. 
If I do, she will find out. He refused. Oh, come on, it's just Taunton. Pardon me if I have a healthy respect for your pig. She is only creature I know that can make Torah go back to the daimyo's wife willingly. Location, Jiraiya's Training Ground They stood in separate parts of the training ground. Zuko was meditating underneath the cold waterfall, chilling him to the bone. Saka was meditating next to the fire, making him sweat. Naruto sat on the edge of the stream, looking over a scroll. Sniffing something in the air, Akela stood up. What is it, Akela? Saka asked as he opened his eyes. Zuko opened his eyes as well and Naruto put the scroll down. They all noticed a nearby bush rustle making both Saka and Zuko put a hand on their swords. When they saw a pig come through the bush, they were surprised, they just managed to keep it off their faces. Tantan, what are you doing here? Naruto asked as he stood up and lit a cigarette. She winked at him and showed him the note. He walked over, took the note out, opened it and read it. What does it say? Zuko asked. He read the note aloud guys. I have to be seen in public with the Hokage for a few hours, and since I need all of my chakra to you all nowadays, I can't use a clone. So I'm having Tantan keep an eye on you for a while. Just stick to the training regime. Jiraiya. Well that seems pretty simple. Saka noted. Hold on, there's a postscript. He said before reading it aloud. Akela. If you're thinking about turning the pig into a snack, don't. I'm fairly certain Tantan will have no trouble kicking your furry rear. I'm also sure she will do it with pleasure. Akela, who had eyeing Tantan, now looked at her with a small amount of fear. Fear. She took one step towards him, and he swiftly backpedaled. The wolf being afraid of the pig, Naruto said. You've gotta admit, that's funny. It's hilarious. Zuko replied. He did find it a little funny. Usually, the pig would be afraid of the wolf. So then, we keep to the regime. Saka said. He did say that. And with no warning, he leapt out from under the waterfall, swords in hand, swinging at Naruto's head. Saka joined him by thrusting his jin at Naruto's stomach. He blocked both of them by using his own jin and a stray kunai. Not going to give me any warnings, huh? The blonde asked jokingly as he took a drag with his free hand and blew smoke in their faces. Why would we? Saka asked back. Thus began a free-for-all fight. Location, Azula. She stood in the backyard of the academy. Due to the fact that something special was going on, classes started later, leaving her alone. She had her daggers out and stood in front of one of the training dummies. Ever since she and Zuko fled the Fire Nation, she constantly practiced her dagger skills. She lunged at the dummy, slashing and stabbing. She went through the sets and moves Naruto had drilled into her head. She did them over and over again. Finally, when she was done, the training dummy looked like a dog had all but torn it to shreds. I guess Naruto instructing me did actually help. She remarked. She sheathed her daggers and walked out of the academy backyard. She walked back onto the street, where she saw everyone bustling around in a hurry. Hey, Azula! Called out Kiba. She turned her head to him, and saw he was standing near a wall with his team as well as hers. Come over here. I'm coming, I'm coming. She walked over to them. What's this all about? People look like they're either trying to clean up their house or their business. Business. She had seen plenty of that when she left the hotel to head to the academy to train. That's because today is the day that the foreign heads of state and such come in today. Shino explained. They come to the final exam to see how the participants will do. It also helps attract clients for the villages of Shinobi. It's also a good event for gambling. Hinata told them as they all left the academy backyard and headed onto the streets. Yeah, you should see the odds. Kiba agreed. Odds? 
repeated a confused Aang. A way of betting money, Azula told him before turning her attention back to Kiba. What are they like? Most odds on Naruto have him winning. But the odds on Sokka and Zuko have them losing. Ha! Huh. Damn right they will. A voice shouted in the street. They turned and saw that it was the team from Kusa. They'll be dead within five minutes. Suajetsa declared. And you are who, exactly? Suki asked. We are the other Jinin team that made it to the final exam. Yugo answered. So Saka and the others will have to face off you guys? Katara asked for clarification. Man, they'll be able to win easily. Toph declared. What did you say? Suajetsa roared at her. You heard her, didn't you? Or are you deaf? Azula asked. Get your facts straight, you midget. He snarled at the blind earthbender. Team Avatar will be dead by the time we're done with them. So you're going to kill us too? Aang asked, scared. These guys were really making him scared now. Of course not, you idiot, Karen said condescendingly. You don't concern us. But if you want to find us after the exam. Suajetsu left the question hanging, which scared Aang even more. Suajetsu, enough, Yugo said. Ah, don't worry, I won't kill them. There wouldn't be any fun in it. Let's keep moving. He went down the street with his teammates behind him. That was, a little intense. Katara remarked. Are you kidding? That was nothing. Azula said. Yeah, that was normal. Kiba agreed. You have got, got to be joking. Aang said, almost shouting at them. Did you not see how he was looking at us? Sheesh, twinkle toe, Toph said back. Toughen up a little, will ya? Toph is right. If you keep acting like this, you will not last long here. Shino agreed. We're not going to stay long after this. The air nomad told him. We know. Anyway, Azula said, cutting off the conversation before it went any further, she had done this plenty of times in the past month. Are the heads of state going to come in a parade or something? No. Hinata answered. They'll come in a procession. Nobody will actually stand in a crowd and watch them walk in. Most of them will be led to their suites in the hotels. Most of them? Repeated Suki with a curious tone to it. A few of them will be greeted with by Lady Tsunade. Can we go watch? Katara asked. It might be interesting. Only you would find it interesting. Toph remarked. She thought it was going to be very boring. Actually, I would like to see it as well. It is always interesting to see politics play out. Azula said. You mean for you. Aang accused her in a somewhat joking manner. Comes with being an ex-princess, she said with a shrug. She turned to back to Hinata and her team. So, can we? Well, we know a spot. Kiba answered. You'd have to stay quiet and stay still. We can do that. Let's get going. Follow us. They continued to walk down the street. All around them, people were either hurrying along in the street or tidying up their stores with a passion. They saw this all the way to their destination. Tsunade stood at the gates with Jiraiya at her side and a group of shinobi behind, behind her. Though they didn't turn their heads to see it, they could hear Kurinai's team bringing Azula and the others into the group. They shouldn't be here. Tsunade whispered to him. It's their choice. He whispered back. Besides, this might help out in the long run. We'll see. They stopped whispering as they saw people coming towards the gate. This was where they had to pay attention, the backbones of the other great shinobi countries were coming. In other words, the Kazekage, the Mizukage, the Reikage, and the Tsuchikage had come to Konoha. The first group was a familiar one. Greetings, Lady Tsunade. 
Gara said as he stood in front of her with his retinue behind him. Lord Jiraiya. Gara, Tsunade greeted in return. You know my sister and brother? He gestured to Tamari and Kankoro. Yes, but I'm afraid I do not know who the other two members of your party are. She said, looking at the members in question. This is my sensei, Baki, and my student, Matsuri. Baki was a tall man. He wore a cloth around the top of his head and let the end cover the left side of his face. He had two red tattoos on the right side of his face and wore his headband around his forehead. He wore the Suna flak jacket, which was beige, had shoulder padding and pouches over the stomach. Matsuri wore the same jacket, minus the shoulder padding, over a dark shirt and skirt. She wore stockings, black gloves, and arm guards. Due to the fact of how close she stood next to Gara, the two Sanni knew she was more than a student to him. Nice to meet you, Jiraiya said before noticing someone else. Who is this? He asked, looking at a person whose face was hidden by a hood. Gara was about to tell them when the hooded member spoke. I'm surprised you don't recognize me, Lord Jiraiya, considering I acted in your movie. Acted in my movie? He looked closer, trying to see her face. Koyuki Kazahana, is that you? He asked once he had a glimpse. The person smiled and lowered the hood, revealing the daimyo of the Land of Spring. It's good to see you again, Lord Jiraiya. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Lady Tsunade. She greeted the Hokage. Lady Kazahana, why are you traveling with the Kazekage? She asked. I still have trouble trusting Yukigekyo Shinobi. So I traveled with Lord Gara to come to Konoha. This would be your first time seeing a Chunin exam, yes? Yes. Why come now? She smiled. I think we both know the reason. Tsunade and Jiraiya did indeed, and it had to do with a certain blonde. Fair enough, I hope you enjoy Konoha. She smiled and nodded. They walked on and let the next group come forward. Well, well, if it isn't the Toad Sage and the Slug Princess. The short, old man with the hat of the Tsuchikage said. His beard was done triangularly and his mustache had angular corners. The top of his head was bald and the hair in the back was done up in a top knot held by a yellow ribbon. His eyebrows were thick and his nose was big and red. He wore a green and yellow coat that had a red collar. Underneath the coat, he wore the flak jacket of Iwagakure and mesh armor over a shirt and pants. Raya Tenba no Anoki, Anoki of both scales, Jiraiya greeted the Tsuchikage politely. It's been some time since you have come here. You make it sound like I want to be here. He replied grumpily. If that's not it, then why are you? To see the value of potential enemies, he answered shortly. Geez, old man, can't you say we came to see their Jinchuriki in action? The girl behind him asked. She had black hair and wore her headband around her forehead. She wore a red shirt with the right sleeve missing. She wore the same flak jacket as Anoki, which was brown, had a pouch over the stomach and a sleeve that covered her left arm, showing only the black gloves she wore. Once she had uttered those words, two killing intents were directed at her. her. If I were you, young lady, Tsunade growled. I would refrain from calling him that in my or Jiraiya's presence. Why should I? She asked back defiantly. Kuratsuchi, be polite. She is the Hokage. The third member of the group, a large man with big cheeks and a pump nose, told her. He wore a red shirt and pants along with a flak jacket. He had on a scarf and wore his headband like a bandana. I don't have to be polite to her, Akatsuchi. I don't follow her. But she is still someone to respect. Enough. Anoki shouted, cutting her off before she could speak again. The two of you are going to give me back pains. You may be my granddaughter, Kuratsuchi, but that does not mean you can be disrespectful to the other Kages. You will apologize to the Hokage right now. All right, old man, I'll apologize. She turned to face Tsunade. I'm sorry, okay? 
Even they both knew she really wasn't, Tsunade and Anoki let it slide. The IWA shinobi walked on and the next group came forward. Lady Tsunade, Lord Jiraiya, it's an honor to meet you. The woman with the hat of the Mizukage greeted them. She was slender and quite fetching too. She had auburn hair that fell to the back of her ankles. She had also tied some of it into a top knot and some of it also covered her right eye. Her visible eye was green. She wore a blue dress that fell to just below her knees. Underneath the dress, she wore mesh armor. She also wore a belt around her waist with a pouch on the back. She wore high-heeled sandals along with shin guards that went up over her knees. Mei Terumi, we are glad to welcome the fifth Mizukage to Kanoha. Tsunade greeted her. Your efforts to bring Kiri away from its dark past are becoming well known. Jiraiya complimented her. If this had been any other time, he would have been grinning perversely at her. But this was not the time for that. He might be a super pervert, but he also knew when to rein it in. You flatter me, Lord Jiraiya. However, I would like to discuss trading and political ties with Kanoha. The Mizukage said to the both of them. I'll be sure to meet with you. Tsunade promised. Thank you. May I introduce my guards, Ao and Chojuro? Ao was a middle-aged man. His hair was blue and pointed upwards. While his right eye was covered by an eye patch, his left eye was blue. He wore talismans from his ears, and he wore a striped, gray suit. Over the suit was a green Hayori. Chojuro also had blue hair, but his was tufty. He wore square, black-rimmed hair over his dark eyes. He also wore a blue, pinstriped shirt and camouflage pants. On each pants leg was a shuriken holster. He wore a holster bearing his headband over his shirt. Strapped to the back of the holster was an odd-looking sword covered in bandages, save for the two handles. That's the Hiramakari, isn't it? Jiraiya asked Chojuro, looking at the sword. You're a member of the Seven Shinobi Swordsmen of the Mist, aren't you? You um, yes, I am. He answered hesitantly. Chojuro, how many times have I told you to be more confident? Ao snapped at him. Enough, you too, May said. Please do not fight in front of our hosts. She paused and looked at Chojuro. But Ao is right, Chojuro. You should be more confident. Yes. Yes, Lady May. They walked on and the next group came forward. Lord Rakage, welcome to Kanoha. Jiraiya greeted the man wearing the hat of the Rakage. Jiraiya, Tsunade, he curtly greeted in return. He was a tall man with dark skin. He had a very muscular build, like he worked out constantly. He wore his blonde hair combed back and had a small mustache as well as a beard. He wore simple pants and no shirt, just a hayori over his upper body. On his arms were thick, golden bangle bracelets. He also wore a gold belt that had the face of a boar engraved upon it. Boss, it doesn't hurt to be polite. One of his guards told him. The guard was tall and dark-skinned as well. He had a nose that was slightly bulbous and shaggy white hair, while also having a lazy look. He wore a sleeveless, high-collared uniform with baggy pants. He wore the Kumo flak jacket, which was white and had only one strap, over the uniform. On his left shoulder was a tattoo of the kanji for lightning while on his right shoulder was the kanji for water. Darui, why are you telling Lord A what to do? Asked the other guard. His skin was white, while his hair was blonde and his eyes were dark. He wore a black shirt and pants with the flak jacket over the shirt. He also wore black arm guards that ran up to his elbows, as well as red and white shin guards over sandals. He wore his headband on his forehead. Hey, I'm just saying, see. Darui replied. Darui, see, be quiet. They ordered them. Yes, Lord A. They replied. And not a word out of you, B, he warned the fourth member of their group. The man had a muscular build, same as the rakage, and also had dark skin. 
He also had blonde hair, which was combed back, and a goatee. He wore oval sunglasses, so no one could see his eyes. The cloth on his headband, which he wore on his forehead, was white. On his left cheek was a blue tattoo of two bull horns, and on his right shoulder was the kanji for iron. He wore a simple pair of dark pants, which had two white straps on each leg. On his arms were hand guards and on his legs were shin guards, both were red and white. Instead of a shirt, he wore a flak jacket and a white scarf. He also wore a long red rope belt around his waist. On his back, strangely enough, were seven swords. Please, brother. You think Killer B is gonna speak? You'll use your iron claw, and I won't see for a week. He replied in a rapping style. For those who hadn't heard his rapping, they just looked at him like he had sprouted a second head. Damn it B, how many times have I told you to stop rapping? The rakage shouted at him. Do I have to count? Because if I do, I'm sure you'll punch my lights out. Killer B, as entertaining as always, Jiraiya greeted him. Lo and behold, I see a fellow member of getting knocked out cold. Jiraiya the Toad Sage, you look like you haven't changed. Fool, you fool. Your rapping still needs work. Is that little Uchiha in town? I want to go at him again and knocked him to the ground. B looked around as he said those words. That's not why we came here, B, and you know it. The rakage told him. I assume you are here for the same reason the other Kage are? Tsunade asked. Of course, it is. A new voice spoke from behind them. That's why we came too. Everyone turned to see who spoke. They were both surprised and shocked to see it was Kisame. But he wasn't alone. All the known members of the Akatsuki were there as well. They all became alert when the recognition finally seeped through. The guards from Kumo stood in front of B, ready to defend him. What are you all doing here? Demanded A. Are you all so confident that you'll try to take him in broad daylight? No. Itachi spoke. That was not our intent at all. Then what are you doing here? Especially you, Itachi? Asked Tsunade. Tsunade. It's almost like you want us to try and take you. If you do that, then Amagekure will have no choice but to declare war on Kanoha. A different voice announced. The person speaking could not be seen, but people could tell it was a woman just by the voice. Jiraiya froze. Not only did he know the voice belonged to a woman, but he had heard it before, when it sounded much younger. Conan, is that you? He called out. The members of Akatsuki were surprised by the fact Jiraiya apparently knew the person talking, although they were able not show their surprise on their faces. Stand aside. The person ordered them. They back away and the person walked forward. The person was indeed a woman and quite a beautiful one too. She had blue hair, amber eyes, wore lavender eye shadow, and had a labored piercing. In her hair, she wore a paper flower. Her facial expression was a neutral one. Whatever she wore was covered by the cloak of the Akatsuki covering her. It has been a long time, Jiraiya-sensei. She said. Did she say Jiraiya-sensei? The other shinobi asked silently in their heads. The only exception was Tsunade. I remember you. The Hokage said, looking at the woman. You were one of those orphans Jiraiya took care of. Indeed, I am, Lady Tsunade. She said, bowing her head once to the older woman. Why are you here? And why do you wear the cloak of the Akatsuki? I am here on the behalf of Amage Kure. Our leader has sent me to observe the genin who have made it to the final exam. She explained. These men are my guards. So, if there are any attacks on any one of them, I will consider it an attack on AIM. Both Tsunade and Jiraiya tensed. Even though she didn't outright say it, they knew what she meant. She had essentially declared that AIM was in the hands of the Akatsuki, giving them political power, and that she was here to watch Naruto. If she was here on behalf of AIM and the other members of Akatsuki were her guards, 
it meant they were under the protection of diplomatic immunity. If anyone tried to attack them right then and there, it would ignite a war between them and AIM. That was something the two of them did not need at the moment. Very well, we welcome you to Kanoha. Tsunade finally said. But know that if you or your guards attack anyone, we will treat as an attack as well. Do not worry, Lady Tsunade. We are only here to watch, nothing more. She began to walk forward. What happened to the other two, Conan? Jiraiya asked her. She stopped walking, but didn't turn to face him. They died, a long time ago. She walked into the village and the other members followed her. The shinobi from other countries watched on as they walked down the road before hesitantly following them. This might complicate things. He sighed as they heard the shinobi behind them disperse. Only if they try something, Tsunade replied. Tsunade, the Akatsuki have taken control of AIM, you know what that means. I know. Not even the three of us were able to beat him. He reminded her. He could still remember that day with perfect clarity, how they survived was the clearest. I said I know, Jiraiya. She did know. It was an almost scary thought. Someone had been able to take control of AIM away from the same person who had given them the title of Sanin. Someone had killed Sanshuo no Hanzo, Hanzo of the Salamander. Location, Jiraiya's Training Ground. They had finished the free-for-all a little while back. Now they were working on evasion. It was Saka's and Akela's turn, as they dodged Kunai and Shuriken from Naruto and fire from Zuko. Had it been the beginning of the month, they might have been able to dodge the fire, but that would have been it. Now, he got the odd kunai or shuriken while the wolf dodges them completely. When is my turn going to be over? He asked as he ducked under a fireball. Less complaining, more evading, Naruto told him, throwing a kunai and a shuriken at the same time. They all heard taunt and oink behind them, but they didn't turn around. They heard someone come through the bushes. I'm back. Jiraiya announced. Did Tonton keep an eye, you guys? Yes, she did. Zuko replied. Were there any troubles? Well, there was this one part where Akela tried to attack her. She punched him so hard, I think her hand bruised. Naruto remarked, keeping a straight face. How can Tonton have a bruised hand? She's a pig. Jiraiya asked dryly. All right then, you're the real fucking sadist. The blonde said, still keeping the straight face. He grimaced. Don't call me that. It's better than pervy sage. Naruto told him. I agree with him. Zuko said. The same here, Saka stated. Without warning, he grabbed his boomerang and threw it at Jiraiya. He quickly sidestepped to let it fly past and ducked to avoid a stream of fire from Zuko. When he stood up again, all three of them were coming at him with swords drawn. Zuko came in low, Saka came up the middle and Naruto swung high. He quickly pulled out two kunai and managed to block all three of them. You've taken the lessons to heart. He said with approval. You can go now, Tonton. I'll take it from here. Tonton nodded and walked into the bush. As she trotted away, she heard the sounds of metal clashing, Jiraiya shouting Ranjishigami no Jutsu, Wild Lion's main technique. And Naruto all but screaming watch his hair. Watch his hair. Location, the academy. Azula stood against the wall as the students walk into the room. What are you, what are you doing here? One of them asked her as they sat down in the seats. Azula is here because she requested something of me. Irika told the class. She is interested in learning more about the previous Hokages. That was partially true. She wanted to know about a specific Hokage, the blonde-haired one. It took her a bit, but she realized that was the same person she had seen in the swamp. How does that concern us, Irika-sensei? Another student asked. He smiled at them. You are the students. 
you're supposed to learn the information I tell you. Why don't you tell her about the Hokages? That got a chorus of groans from the students. If you like, we can make it a pop quiz. That silenced the groans. I thought not. We'll start with the show dame Hokage. Who can tell me about him? One student stood up. His name was Hashirama Senju. She answered. What was he famous for? Well, he helped found the village. What else? He pressed her. Um, he wa. He was also known for his use of mokutan wood style. Another student said, standing up as the first sat back down. He was a woodbender? Azula repeated, trying to make sure she hadn't heard wrong. In a sense, yes, he was. Irika told her, he had been briefed about benders from Tsunade after the meeting she had with her. He turned his attention back to the student. Who succeeded him as the night in Hokage? His brother, Tobarama Senju, the student answered promptly. What was he famous for? He created the academy, the ANBU, the Chunin exams, and the Kanoha military police force. Another student stood up. He was also a master of Suitun, water style, ninjutsu. He could create his own water out of the thin air or from himself. He could also perform complex techniques with a single hand seal. She said as the other sat down. Very good, and who succeeded him as Hokage? Irika asked her. When she didn't answer, another student stood up. He passed on the title of Hokage to his student, Hiruzen Saratobi, in the midst of the First Shinobi World War. What was the Sandame Hokage famous for? The teacher asked the student. He has fought in all three Shinobi World Wars, and he trained the Sanin. Sanin. Is that all? No. He also knew all the forms of shinobi combat and had complete mastery over them, which earned him the title of professor. He was also the holder of the monkey summoning contract. And who succeeded him? He was succeeded by Minato Namakase, but retook the position after the Yandame Hokage had died. This was where Azula really started paying attention. And how was the Yandame Hokage famous? Irika asked. The student sat down and another stood up. He was known throughout the shinobi world as Kanoha no Kiroi Senko, Kanoha's yellow flash, due to his use of the Hiration no Jutsu, flying thunder god technique. During the third shinobi world war, enemy had flee on-site orders if they had ever encountered him. A third student stood up. He's also famous for defeating the QB 16 years ago. But he died afterwards and the third Hokage had to step in again. When she heard that, Azula froze. She started to remember things she had heard or seen before, small things about Naruto that seemed inconsequential at the time. For a brief moment she would have sworn she had seen a head of a large fox snarling behind him. You know how I always think that Naruto has two auras? What did I do? Am I really a demon? Why do they keep hurting me? I am responsible for the hell he's been through. It sounded like he had woken up from a dream. Then he started to talk to himself. I didn't hear much, but I did hear the words Akatsuki Jinchuriki and Yanbi Dot. He's never told us about his past. I came to these lands so I could leave my past behind me. Like the fact you thought you were a demon when you were a child? There was an incident when I was born. As a result, the village lost its leader and many lives. Because I was born on the same day, they took it out on me. I'm sorry I kept things from you, Azula. But I didn't want you to know about them. Them. I heal quickly. No one heals that quickly. I do. She sighed. This is one of your secrets, isn't it? He just nodded. You're going to have tell me them someday. Maybe, but it's not today. All I had were my past experiences, and they're not something I like to remember. Does he not realize what the necklace is for? Geez, old man, can't you say we came to see their Jinchuriki in action? Azula, Azula, are you all right? Irika's voice called out at her. 
What? She said, coming back to the rest of the world. I asked you if you were all right. Yes, I'm fine. She turned to the class. Thank you for all you've said. She bowed shortly to them all. So you learned everything you wanted to know? Yes. I have to leave now. Goodbye. She left the room before he could even speak. She all but ran out of the academy and back onto the street. Naruto and I need to have a talk right now. She thought to herself. The problem is I don't know where he is. I saw Lord Jiraiya a few hours ago. She heard a woman nearby speak to her friends. He walked right past the hot springs and into the nearby woods. What's wrong with that? One of her friends asked. This is Lord Jiraiya, the man who peeps at women in the hot springs whenever they are in. I have never known him to just walk past a hot spring when there were women in it. It kinda makes me concerned. You mean didn't know? Another friend asked her. Know what? Lord Jiraiya is training Naruto Uzumaki and his teammates for the final Chunin exam. They've been living in the forest near the hot springs for a month. Well, isn't that helpful? Azula thought to herself as she made her way to the hot springs. Loca location, Jiraiya's training ground. He had them stand in the water and practice the forms over and over again. They had done this countless times during the month, so they had gotten used to it. They had also gotten used to the fact that Jiraiya would randomly strike at them, seeing if their concentration would break. He walked in front of them, watching them carefully. Without warning, he threw a punch at Saka. He deflected the punch and kept going through the forms, like nothing had happened. Better. He simply stated. He swung his leg at Zuko, who blocked it and kept on moving through the form. Without saying anything, he pulled out a kunai and swung it at Naruto. He disarmed him, tossed the kunai away, and kept doing the forms. He kept on randomly attacking them for the next half hour. Every time, they would block, deflect or disarm him. They'd done it so many times during the month, it had become a reflex. All right, that's enough. You guys can stop. They relaxed their bodies, but kept their minds on alert. It wouldn't have been the first time Jiraiya would tell them to stop, only to suddenly attack them. That was what alerted them. Hit the ground. Zuko cried out. They all ducked as a large fireball sailed over their heads and hit a nearby tree, setting it ablaze. Did anyone else notice that fireball was blue? Saka asked. For some reason, he had a feeling something dangerous was coming towards them. Trust me, I saw it too. Naruto told him. And I only know one person who can do that. They all looked up and saw Azula standing at the edge of the training ground with a very angry expression on her face. When she looked at Naruto, she snarled and threw another fireball at him. He leapt back into the surrounding bush to dodge. They could all hear the footsteps getting fainter. She growled and went after him. Should we go after them? Saka asked. Not when Azula is like that. Zuko told him. He had been on the receiving end of that attitude to know better now. Location, Naruto and Azula. Naruto had managed to distance himself away from the training ground with Azula on his heels. They finally stopped in a small clearing. Azula, what's the matter with you? He asked as they circled one another. Why didn't you tell me? She asked, bending another fireball at him. Tell you what? He dodged it and still kept his distance. She bent a stream of fire at him. What, did you think it was something only you needed to know about? You're not making any sense. He told her as he rolled out of the way of the stream. Stop lying. I know everything. She bent a barrage of fireballs at him. He ducked low and moved forward. Reaching out and grabbing her wrists, he yanked them downward, stopping the barrage. What are you talking about, Azula? He asked her. I'm talking about the fact that you have a demon sealed inside you, and you never bothered to tell us. 
she shouted. The clearing fell quiet as the shout echoed in the trees. How do you find out? He finally asked, his voice turning quiet. I didn't put it together until today. I had asked Irika about the pervious Hokages. He, in turn, asked the class, and they told me. When they got to the Yandame defeating the Kyubi, things started to make sense. What do you mean? You told me that there was an incident on the day you were born and people blamed you for it. When you were a child, you wondered if you were a demon, so that must have meant people actually thought you were one. You left this land behind to escape your past, which means that your ex experiences with this place had become too much, and you wanted to go somewhere people didn't know who you were. I also know that you talk to yourself when you think you're alone and somehow, the words Yanbi and Jinchuriki mean something to you. But the Yanbi, which sounds similar to Kyubi, was not the one to attack Kanoha, so that must mean you are not the only one. She listed off the details while looking him straight in the eye. He was silent for a few minutes before letting out a defeated sigh. You always did have a keen eye. He said, praising her. On the day of my birth, the Kyubi attacked the village. The Yandame Hokage sealed it inside of me to save the village and sacrificed himself in the process. A Jinchuriki is someone who holds a biju inside of them. I am the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. Why didn't you tell me, or the others? She demanded once he had stopped. What was I supposed to say? He asked back. That I had a fox seal inside my stomach that had the ability to destroy the Fire Nation if he felt like it? That there was a chance that he could take control of my body and go on a rampage? Hey, we have an agreement. The QB protested. I don't take over your body unless you're unconscious and we're in the middle of a fight. And since that never really happened anymore, he didn't take control. She doesn't know that, QB. I'm using it as an example. His Jinchuriki silently replied. Did you think that we would treat you differently if you did tell us? Azula demanded, yanking her hands out of his grip. Yes. That's why I left in the first place. He answered, raising his voice to match hers. Everyone kept looking at me with hate, disgust or fear, and the first twelve years of my life, I didn't know why. I couldn't make any friends because parents kept telling their kids to stay away from from me. I was beaten on a regular basis, and I couldn't even go to a hospital to get treated, they would just throw me out. Do you think I would want to go through that again in a new land after I had just left it behind? It would have been different. How would you know that? The reaction would have been the same. If I had told you, odds were that you would have wanted nothing to me. You'd just look at me like I was a freak. So yes, I didn't tell you about what I held but can you blame me? The forest all around them echoed with the silence that followed. I know you wanted to keep this a secret. She finally said. But I'm also hurt that you didn't think I would be able to see you as human and not a demon. If you can't trust me, how can I trust you? What are you talking about, Azula? You are not my bodyguard anymore. If I can't have your trust, you will not defend me she declared in an authoritative voice. Never once had he expected to hear those words come from her mouth. What? You can't mean that. I've been protecting you for three years. And you've been keeping secrets from me. I've been tolerant of that, but I can't take it anymore. Until we can trust each other, we're done. He looked like he had been slapped, having understood what she meant by done. Azula. He tried to say to her. Naruto, please just don't. She turned her back on him. Let's just leave each other alone for now, okay? She didn't wait for an answer. She walked into the bushes and away from him. He stood there, listening to her footsteps getting fainter. Kit? You okay? The QB finally dared to ask. I've just been effectively dumped over you, QB. Do you think I feel okay? He asked back, still sounding like he couldn't believe it. Um, would me saying sorry make you feel better? Not really, no. I figured as much. Location, 
Kanoha Arena. It had been two days since the Kages and the Daimyos had arrived. It was the day of the final exam and the arena was packed. People had literally fought in the streets over tickets leading to the day. Some, mostly shinobi, had been smart enough to get a ticket a month beforehand. Hey, there are some seats over there. Kiba declared as he, the other members of the Kanoha 11 in Kanoha, and the team avatar walked into the stands. There was indeed an empty row of seats, which looked like it could seat everyone. They all sat down, proving the assumption true. Up in the Kage box, all five of the Kages had been seated and waited the beginning of the exam. This will be a very interesting day. May remarked. She could already see that the stands were packed. If anything, at least we'll be able to see a couple of good fights. Be wrapped. Seeing people get beat down will make us feel all right. B, knock it off. I told him. Where are Conan and her guards? Tsunade asked Jiraiya in a whisper. The toad sage stood behind her chair, like a guard keeping watch. They have a private booth and are being constantly monitored. He quietly answered. She nodded in acknowledgement and looked down at the field. She saw five people waiting behind the proctor for the beginning of the exam. Meanwhile, others were doing the same thing. Why is Sokka wearing a cloak and hood? Aang wondered aloud. Sokka was indeed wearing a dark cloak with the hood drawn over his head. They could because he was talking animatedly with Zuko, and because Akela sat on his haunches by his side. I guess we'll find out. Suki replied. Have you noticed? Ten Ten quietly asked Shikamaru. Yeah, I did. He replied. It's a drag. What are members of the ANBU doing here? Kiba asked the others as he looked and noted the location of each ANBU member, Akamaru was too big to come with him now, so he stayed home. Perhaps for extra security? Suggested Niji. All five of the Kages are here. But the last time ANBU was posted as security during the final exam, we got invaded. Ino pointed out. Something. Something's going to happen. Ten Ten said. We'll have to be ready. Everyone agreed, everyone, except Hinata. What is the matter, Hinata? Shino asked her. Something is not right. She said as she kept looking around the field, obviously trying to find something. There are A and B U stationed all around the arena. Choji pointed out. I don't mean that. Look down at the field. They did so and immediately saw what she meant. Hey guys, we're not the only ones who are seeing this, right? Katara asked the rest of them. Trust me, Katara, we're seeing it too. Kiba assured her. As a matter of fact, everyone in the arena began to notice it too. Down in the field, standing behind the proctor, were Zuko, Sokka, Suijetsu, Karen, and Yugo. There were only five people there. Soon, everyone in the arena, including the Kages and the delegation from AIM, with the exception of three people, all had the same question. Where is Naruto Uzumaki? Chapter 39, Being Ready and Being Watched Location, Kanoha Arena The quite noticeable absence of Naruto began to stir up the crowd. He was the reason most of the people there had come. They wanted to see him in combat, the others were just second fiddles. But now, all they had were said fiddles. Where the hell is he? Demanded Kiba. Most of the people came here to see him. If he doesn't want to show up, that is his choice. Azula told him curtly. Everyone looked at her after that. What? Uh, did something happen with you and Naruto? Katara asked hesitantly. Are you him? She asked back, sounding more irritated than Kurt now. No. Then don't butt in on things you don't know about. She snapped. Okay, okay, sorry. The waterbender apologized. Meanwhile, up in the Kage box, the Kages were wondering the same thing. Where is that brat? 
Anoki asked. I don't know, no, but let's get this exam started. Said it. He may be come to see the Jinchuriki, but they couldn't afford to wait around for him. Should we not wait for him? May suggested. He is just one person. There are five others who are waiting to fight. He's right. Tsunade declared as she stood up from her seat. She walked forward to the banister and took a deep breath. Welcome, everyone. She said in a loud voice, getting the attention of every single person there. Thank you for coming to Kanoha for the Chunin exams. We will now begin the final exam. We also ask you not to leave the arena until all the matches are done. Now then, enjoy yourselves. When he heard that, the proctor, Genma Shiranui, turned to the five on the field. All right, listen up. He said. There are no rules in these fights. The match will go on until one of the fighters is dead or claims defeat. If I say a match is over, I will step in and stop it, no arguments. Are there any questions? No one said a word. In that case, everybody except for Saka and Suajetsa head to the waiting area. Karen and Yugo started to walk away, while Zuko looked at Saka's hood-covered face. You ready? He asked the tribesman. Of course, I am. He answered. He turned to look at the wolf sitting next to him. Akela, go with him. Akela gave him a pointed look. I'll be fine. Besides, do you really want to attack a guy who can turn into water? He might give you an impromptu bath. He winced and finally nodded. He stood up, padded over to Zuko, and the two walked away. This might be an interesting match. Kisame said as he watched from the private booth. He and the rest of the Akatsuki were standing around Conan, who was the only person to be sitting. What makes you say that, hmm? Daydara, a former IWA shinobi with long blonde hair done up in a half ponytail and with a bang covering his left eye asked. We have fought alongside Saka once when we were in the bending countries. Itachi explained. He was the only one in the Avatar's group to recognize the fact that people had to die that day. On the other hand, Suijetsu is the younger brother of Mangetsu Hozuki. Kisame pointed out. And how is that relevant? Kakuzu, a tall man with a white hood and a black mask covering his head, leaving his green eyes visible, asked. Mangetsu was one of the few members of the seven swordsmen I know of that had mastered all seven of the blades, even Samahata, who is quite picky when to wielders. He explained. It'll be interesting to see if his younger brother has even half of his talent. Man, I can't believe I'm fighting you. Suijetsu complained as he stood in front of his opponent. I wanted to fight Uzumaki. Why? You'd get a longer fight with me. Saka told him. Are you stupid? You'd think I'd be able to beat him that easily? Actually, the way the three of us figured it out, he'd beat you in five seconds. What did you say? He snarled. You hurt me. Or did you forget what he did to your head? He reached for the Kubikiribocho. All right, that's it. Let's fight. In that case, begin. Jinma ordered before stepping back. Suijetsu charged forward, swinging the Kubikiribocho. I'm gonna slice your head off. He declared, swinging the giant blade down at his head. You'd think I'm gonna let that happen? Saka remarked. With quick speed, he pulled out his club and used it to swap the sword aside. Suijetsu was surprised and almost fell down. But he quickly recovered. He regained his balance and turned into a spin, swinging the Kubikiribocho in a circle. Saka stepped back to avoid the strike. His opponent pressed forward, keeping the sword moving. What's the matter? He asked. Not going to fight ba back? He stopped, ducked under the swing of the blade, and then swung his club upwards. It struck Suijetsu in the stomach, causing water to splash out and forcing him to withdraw the club. A blunt instrument against him won't do any good, 
and I can't pull out my Jian or my boomerang until I'm certain he's shown all the moves he knows with the Kubikiribocho. He analyzed the situation. Well, I'll have to make do. Why hasn't Saka attacked? Aang asked as he watched his friend avoid the strikes of Suijetsu. I thought he would have charged straight in and attacked. He might have, if I didn't beat it out of his head. Jiraiya's voice spoke next to all of them. They all turned and saw him standing on the stairs. Lord Jiraiya? I thought you were protecting Lady Tsunade. Ten Ten said, surprised to see him standing there. Oh, I am, but the one up there is just a clone. He gestured briefly with a hand up to the Kage box to emphasize his point. I figured that I keep an eye on you guys. We are perfectly capable of protecting ourselves, Lord Jiraiya. Shino told him. I meant them. He pointed to Aang and the others. I'm here to make sure they don't do anything stupid. How wonderful, somebody to keep an eye on us because they think we might do something. Tof said sarcastically from where she lounged in the seat. If she could see, her feet would have been up. But she wasn't and they were planted firmly on the ground. Sorry, it's just a precaution. Whatever. So why isn't Sokka attacking? Suki asked the toad sage, getting his attention. Attention. All the while, the sounds of battle went on below them. If he had, the match wouldn't have lasted long. He explained. He is smart and tries to keep a cool head in the middle of a fight, but he just attacked. His analyzing skills were virtually non-existent and that can get him killed. So, I took some time and taught him how to analyze an opponent. He kept his club close to him as Suijetsu kept on attacking. Every time the sword got close, he would knock it away. He kept dodging and evading, infuriating Suijetsu. Come on, fight back. He shouted. I'll fight when I want to. The tribesman replied. This only infuriated him more. He let out an angry shout and pressed forward. He kept swinging, trying to cut him. Saka would keep on blocking and deflecting. Then he did something unexpected. He suddenly charged forward, swinging the club. He tried to hammer away at Suijetsu, who was using the Kubikiribocho to block. He's using the Kubikiribocho as a form of shield. He noted. Now to figure out if it will stay in that one position, or if he will move it to accommodate. He tried to attack from every possible angle. Suijetsu kept using the sword as a shield, but always kept it in the same position. Sure, he would move it to block a strike from a different angle, but the handle always stayed close to his head while the blade pointed downwards. I have to keep going. He could be deceiving me, I have to be sure. He thought to himself as he kept attacking. What's up with this guy? Suijetsu asked himself. One minute, he's avoiding my strikes and the next, he trying to pound me into the ground. He did his best to block the strikes of the club. The arena began to echo with the clang of the club hitting the sword. Hang on, there. Every time he attacks, he steps forward, lifting his foot off the ground. If I time it right, I can use Kubikiribocho to trip him. He waited for a good opportunity. Seeing said opportunity, he quickly took Kubikiribocho out of its defensive position and slid it underneath Saka's foot, making him land in the middle of the circle. He pulled back and yanked the blade up. Saka's foot got caught and so, by extension, was he. It didn't last long as he was tripped by the blade. He fell to the ground, crashing into the earth. The club flew out of his hand and landed a good distance away from him. Okay, I probably pushed it too far. He silently admitted. But on the other hand, I now know he can do that. Well, it seems that you finally began to fight back. Suijetsu said. Pity I have to end it though, I was starting to have fun. He stuck the Kobikiribocho into the ground, flashed through hand seals, and then pointed his right hand at him, folding every finger except for his index finger and thumb. Sweetun, Mizudepo no Jutsu, Water Style, Water Gun Jutsu. He cried. 
A small amount of water compressed itself onto the tip of the index finger and then fired itself at Saka. He rolled out of the way, the water hit the ground. He quickly stood up, but jumped back as Suajetsa fired off another round of water. Oh, do you want to dance? He asked Saka. Then let's dance. He kept firing water at the tribesman, trying to kill him. This made Saka keep dodging the water by ducking and weaving. That was the Mizudepo no Jutsu. Ao said with surprise as he watched the Jutsu being used repeatedly. Bubut I thought only members of the Hozuki clan could do that Jutsu. Chojuro protested. Well, it seems that Brad is member of that clan. Anoki remarked. I can actually see the Naide Mizukage in him. I take it that's not a good thing, old man. Karatsuchi asked her leader with a slight teasing tone. I hated that man. I was quite glad when he was killed. He had actually celebrated when he heard the news. Then he mourned his teacher who had killed and was killed by the same man. But the question remains, Lord Anoki, what is a member of the Hozuki clan doing with Kusa? May asked him. That is, if the team is from Kusa after all. Tsunade remarked, getting the attention of everyone there. Where else could they be from? Chojuro asked. No one answered him. Saka was running around, trying to dodge for all his worth. The small balls of water kept missing him by mere inches. And yet, the odd thing was that Suajetsu wasn't getting angry at continually missing him. If anything, he was looking more and more happy. This is so much fun. He declared with an almost maniacal grin. Are you getting frustrated now? Actually, I've faced worse. Saka replied, keeping himself in control. Is this all you've got? No. I have more. He brought up his left hand and started to fire water from that one as well. The amount of water coming at him had been doubled as well as the rate it was coming at him. I had to open my mouth. The tribesman cursed himself quietly. He had to open his mouth. Jiraiya said with a sigh. You've been training him for a month and you're surprised when he does that? Toph asked. No, I was just hoping he wouldn't do it during the middle of the fight. What I want to know is how that guy is waterbending. Aang said, pointing down at Suijetsu. I thought he was a shinobi, not a bender. He's not waterbending. He's using the Mizudepo no Jutsu, which can only be used by the Hozuki clan of Kirigakure. The Toad Sage explained. Why can only they use it? Katara asked him. It seemed fairly easy to duplicate, but she would have to practice to see if she could. That clan has the ability to completely liquefy their bodies. It's called the Suka no Jutsu, Hydrification Jutsu. When they use this Jutsu, anything but an airtight container can't hold them. The only downside we know of is that they are vulnerable to Raitun, Lightning Style, Ninjutsu. Or probably just plain lightning. Azula remarked shortly. Besides, if he can turn his body into water, then that means a waterbender can defeat him easily. Well, that's possible, I suppose. He admitted after looking at her for a brief moment. But we've never had a waterbender in the Chunin exams. Well now, that is quite interesting. Kisame said with a grin as he watched the events turn out in front of him. What makes you say that, Kisame? Toby, a member whose face was covered by a spiral-patterned orange mask with a hole showing his right eye, asked him. Not a single member of the Hozuki clan I knew could use the Mizudepo no Jutsu dual-handed. He explained. Seems easy enough, hmm, Daydara noted. Actually, it takes a good amount of concentration to fire off a round. The fact that Suajetsu can do it with both hands, at the same time, and such a rapid rate is quite impressive. Saka was running circles around Suijetsu, dodging every piece of water shot at him. I did endure that hell of a month just to be killed by water. He swore to himself. If I ever let that happen, it'll because I pissed off Katara. Suijetsu wanted to keep up the jutsu, but the effects were already getting to him. 
the rate of fire began to slow down until it finally died. Saka stopped where he stood and saw Suajetsa panting for breath. You're out of energy already? He asked. Something along those lines, he answered. Fortunately, I know how to get it back and keep you in the dark. He flashed through a different set of hand seals, raised his right hand to his mouth in a half seal, and raised his left hand over his head. Sweetun, Kirigakir no Jutsu, water style, hiding in mist Jutsu. He said, opening his mouth and spewing out white mist. The arena began to be thick with the stuff. Saka couldn't see anything past his own hand. I was be beginning to wonder when he'd bring that out. Kisame said as he watched the mist thicken. So, he can use it as well. Itachi noted. The kid was well on his way to becoming a member of the swordsman when I left. He told his partner. Learning that jutsu is mandatory. Besides, he needs to rejuvenate himself, and the mist gives him the perfect cover. What do you mean? Kakuzu asked. A downside of using the suka no jutsu is that the user has to stay hydrated at all times. The kid figured that if he tried to drink water in the open, Saka would have pounced on the chance to attack him. So, he gave himself some cover. He explained, still keeping his eyes on the field. So, he brought in the Kirigakure no Jutsu. Niji stated. That might cause problems for Saka. What makes you say that? Katara asked him. The Kirigakure no Jutsu is a famous Jutsu from Kiri. Jiraiya explained for her. As you can see, it covers an area in mist, hiding the user from his opponents. The thickness of the mist is determined by much chakra was put into it. This jutsu can go hand in hand with the technique to silently kill. Silently kill? Aang repeated with a worried look. He nodded. Masters of silent killing can use the mist to sneak up to the opponents and kill them without them ever realizing it. Is Sokka going to be okay? Suki asked, feeling very worried about Sokka now. I guess it all depends on whether that Suajetsu kid is a master of silent killing or not. He had managed to drink the amount of water needed and was now hunting Sokka down. He wasn't a master of silent killing, so his footsteps made noise as he walked slowly through the mist which, in his opinion, made it feel worse. Ha, huh, he's probably pissing himself right about now. He thought with glee. Only hearing footsteps, not knowing where I am. He must be completely and utterly terrified. He soon saw the clo cloak he wore standing in the mist. And now, I've gotcha. He swung the kubikiribocho down on the head, intending to cleave him in two. The blade met no resistance as it met the cloak. It was simply cut in two. But as the remains fell to the ground, there was no blood or even a body. What? He said in surprise. What do you know? That stick did come in handy. Saka's voice said from inside the mist. Where are you? He demanded, turning to the direction where the voice was coming from. Do you honestly think I'm going to tell you? How did you know I was coming for you? It was painfully obvious. The sound of your feet on the ground was a dead giveaway. You thought I was terrified of that sound, weren't you? The sound of laughter echoed throughout the mist. There are things I'm more afraid of than ominous footsteps in mist, and one of them is a giant owl librarian. The voice came from a different spot in the mist. Come out here. Suajetsa demanded, swinging the sword around. Out where? We're in the middle of a mist. Again, the voice came from a different place in the mist. He quickly cancelled the jutsu, letting the mist fade away. The only problem was he still didn't see him. Where the hell are you? He yelled. I'm right behind you, moron. He turned around and looked at his enemy. What he saw was not what he was expecting. Saka stood across from him. He wore his armor that Saifu had changed for him. Strapped to his back was both the sheath for his boomerang and his jian, crisscrossing each other. He didn't wear the helmet, he didn't need to. 
He had painted his face the same way he did when Zuko had come to the South Pole looking for Aang. While he had looked serious with it on before, seasoned warriors would have been able to tell he didn't have the experience to back up the look. Now he did and that made the look all the more intimidating. Isn't that the stuff he wore back at the South Pole? Aang asked. Yeah, it is. Katara answered. It looks scarier now. Looking at his friend now sent a small chill up the avatar's spine. Sokka does not look youthful at all. Lee declared. Troublesome. Shikamaru muttered. It's not about being youthful, Lee. It's about making your opponent nervous. Very good, Shikamaru, Jiraiya told him. You know, Sokka reminds me of you, just without the laziness. Once they heard those words, everyone started to see the similarities between the two of them. You know, he's got a point. Ino agreed. I wonder who would win in a game of strategy. Choji said. That would be very interesting to find out. It's too troublesome to figure out now. Their teammate told the two of them. That's your answer to everything. Kiba objected. But in this case, he would be right. Niji said. Saka was currently in the midst of battle. They couldn't stop the fight to find out if he could match Shikamaru on a shogi board. What I want to know is how he can do that thing with his voice. Tof said. He could throw his voice around like that since we were kids. Katara told her. He often did it to annoy me. It's also why no one wanted to play hide-and-go-seek with him. Is all of that supposed to scare me? Suajetsu asked, trying to act like his entire appearance didn't unnerve him. Saka didn't say anything, he just looked at him like he was measuring his worth. If you're not going to do anything, then I'll make you do something. He raised the kubikiribocho above his head. Saka's hand blurred as he pulled out the boomerang and threw it at him. It sliced through his left arm, turning into a jelly-like substance. The boomerang curved back around and sliced through his right arm, turning it, it into the same substance. While his opponent screamed in pain, he just caught the boomerang and put it away. Seems like your arms stay attached even after they've been sliced through. Pity, I guess Naruto's kick was just luck. You think you'll be able to beat me that easily? He screamed as his arms returned to normal. I don't know. Care to find out? The tribesman asked as he drew his jian and took a waterbending stance. He waited as his opponent charged at him. When the kubikiribocho was swung at his head, he lifted the jian in a defensive position. The blades met and, in that moment, he pushed the kubikiribocho up and away, and then brought his own sword down in a slice. Suajetsu stepped back and only got his shirt sliced. He turned into a spin and swung his sword at his opponent's side. Saka swung to meet it, blocking the sword with the side of his jian. He quickly leapt onto the kubikiribocho itself and slashed at his head. He ducked his head to avoid the slash and jerked the blade down, trying to get him fall. His response was to jump off of it in backflip and land a goodly distance away from him. Quickly looking down, he noticed that he had landed right next to the club. Well, that's useful. He remarked. What is? Suajetsu asked as he charged forward. This. He got his foot underneath the club's handle and kicked up in the air. He caught it with his left hand. He stood ready, dual-wielding weapons. Is that supposed to make me nervous? He swung his blade high, intending to once again to slice him in half. Saka stopped the blade by hitting the tip with the Jian's own tip. He took a step forward and swung the club at Suajetsu's midsection. Instead of hearing the sound of it hitting flesh, it hit water, splashing it all over the place. He moved the Jian away from the Kubikiribocho and aimed it directly at his shoulder. Shoulder. He was blocked when Suajetsu moved his blade in front of him, blocking the thrust. So, he can use hold it in other defensive positions, he just tried not to show it. He noted, before twisting to the side. Yanking the club out of Suajetsu, 
he reared it back before striking down at the back of his head. Without even looking back, Suajetsa reached out behind himself and grabbed the club, stopping it short. He pulled it around the side, bringing Saka back to his front. Releasing his grip to hold Kubikiribocho with both hands, he tried to stab him through the stomach. However, releasing his hold on the club proved to be a mistake. Saka stopped the sword with the jian, then using the hooked end of the club to take hold of the Kubikiribocho via the hole in it. Pulling hard, he yanked it out of Suajetsa's hands and sent it flying away in the air. It hit the ground with the tip, causing it to stick to the ground. He tried to stab his opponent in the chest, but he avoided it by taking a step to the side. I need to get Kobikiribocho back. He thought in a panic. He tried running past him, Saka turned low in a half circle, sweeping his foot underneath his feet. He tripped and began to fall to the ground. As he fell, he felt the club hitting his back hard. Even the water sprayed everywhere, he could still feel pain. He tried to move, but only succeeded in lifting his head up from the ground. You know, you might have a few jutsus. But quite frankly, you are totally dependent on this thing. Saka stated as he walked over to where Kobikiribocho stood in the ground. He hooked the club to his belt and sheathed his jian. I wonder how you would do against it. He said as he stood by the giant blade. So, you're going to use it? He asked before giving a harsh bark of laughter. You don't have the strength to pick it up, let alone hold it. He gave, gave a smirk that seemed cold and vicious. I never said I was going to use it. He clasped his hand around the handle and yanked it out of the ground. His eyes turned black and he was enveloped in a cocoon of energy. It was visible for only a second and then it dissipated. In Saka's place, with the Kubikiribocho resting on his shoulder was a man Suajetsu was very familiar with. What? How are you here? He asked in a half shout, half squeak. The pain disappeared due to the fear he felt, allowing him to stand up. Well, if it isn't little Suajetsu Hozuki. Zabuza Momochi said with a grin visible underneath the bandages. What in the name of Lord Jashin is that? Haydn, an Akatsuki member with slicked back silver hair and purple eyes, demanded. That man is dead. Wow, that's so cool. Toby declared with childish glee. Itachi, Kisame, what is this? Conan asked the two. I thought Sabuza Momochi was dead. Oh, don't worry, Sabuza is dead. Kisame said. Then how is he here? If there were emotions in her voice, it would have sounded like she was demanding an answer. Our information about this ability is limited, due to the fact we only saw it once. Itachi answered her. It is an ability called soul bending and from what we gathered, the user takes an item familiar to a person, use it to summon the soul, and then to become it. In this case, Saka has used Kobikiribocho to become Zabuza. So, Zabuza has taken control of the boy's body. Kakuzu summarized. More like Saka has taken command of his soul. How rare is this ability? Conan asked. Soul bending is only able to be used by four specific people, the Paragons. Saka and Naruto are two of those four members. So, the QB brat is one of these soul benders, huh? Daydara asked. Daydara. Daydara, remember which village we are in. Conan said pointedly. They did not need to let unnecessary insults be heard. Seems like the kid's using me to fight you, Zabuza noted. He rolled his shoulders back, loosening up the muscles. Sounds like fun. You're actually going to fight? Suajetsa said, surprised. Of course, after all, he placed the sword on his back. We never finished our spar. He flashed through hand seals and did the same motion Suajetsa did. Kirigakure no jutsu. The mist quickly arrived and quickly thickened. Suajetsa kept looking around, but he could never see where he was. He couldn't hear anything as well. Are you looking for something? He heard Zabuza's voice in the mist. 
You've gotten sloppy, Suijetsu. I thought you were trying to be a part of the Seven Swordsmen. Where the hell are you? He shouted, any shred of calmness and confidence he had left was now gone. I'm right here. He whispered behind him. He spun around and tried to use the Mizudepo no Jutsu. But it was too late. The last thing he saw was the Kubikiribocho coming at him. Well, this match is over. Jiraiya declared. What makes you say that, Lord Jiraiya? Tenten asked him. Suijetsu isn't a master of silent killing, Zabuza is. Once he used the Kirigakure no Jutsu, the fight was over. Are you sure about that? Tof asked. Of course, I'm sure. I trained him for a month after all. Hey, look, the mist is thinning. Aang pointed down to the field, and they all looked down. Jinma watched as the mist began to dissipate. When it was clear enough to see, he saw Zabuza standing over an unconscious Suijetsu, who had turned, turned into the same jelly-like substance his arms had been in. That was pathetic. Zabuza declared, looking down at him. I expected better from you, Suijetsu. He looked over at the proctor. You might as well call it. Saka's voice spoke from Zabuza's mouth, the completely black eyes fading away to reveal blue ones. He nodded in agreement. The winner of the match is Saka of the Southern Water Tribe. As everyone politely applauded, Saka's blue eyes were replaced by Zabuza's brown ones. He looked at the sword in his hand and then looked up at the Kage box. Eh, might as well. Without warning, he charged towards the wall and then ran up it. Before anyone could stop him, he had reached the top and had leapt into the air. His eyes looked over the people in the box and locked on the woman sitting in the chair with the hat of the Mizukage above her. He landed on the banister in front of her. Are you the Mizukage? He asked. Yes, I am. May answered, keeping her expression neutral. He brought the Kubikiribocho up and pointed it at her. Before he or anyone else could do anything, another sword was at his neck. He looked down at the sword and then the person holding it. Who the hell are you, kid, and what in the name of Kami are you doing holding the Hiramakari? He asked Chojuro, who was standing in front of Mei. My name is Chojuro and I am a member of the Seven Swordsmen. He declared, holding Zabuza's gaze. I don't care if you're my senior or not, Zabuza. If you try to harm Lady Mei, I'll send you back to the Shinigami. The two swordsmen stared at each other for what seemed a longer. Then Zabuza began to chuckle. You've got spunk, kid. And you're willing to attack your senior, who could easily beat you. He shook his head as he chuckled. I like that. You keep that attitude up, odds are you'll do well. He stopped chuckling and grew serious again. But you don't need to wor worry about me attacking her, so put that thing away, would ya? He didn't move an inch. It's all right, Chojuro, stand down. Mei told him. He stepped away from Zabuza and put his sword away, but he kept his hands near his holsters. What is it that you need? She asked Zabuza as she stared at the tip of the Kubikiribocho. I'm dead, woman, I don't have needs. I do have a want though. Then what do you want? He turned the sword downwards and stabbed it into the floor in front of her. I want you to make sure this stays in carry. You lose it and I will come back to haunt you, understand? Yes, I do. She took hold of the sword and effortlessly pulled out of the floor. Thank you, Zabuza Momochi. He shrugged. Kubikiribocho is more than a grave marker. He turned around and jumped off the banister. As he was airborne, he aimed himself down at the waiting area. He flew down towards it and landed in a roll. When he came out of the roll, it was Saka again. Always dramatic, aren't you? Zuko asked him as he and Akela walked over to him. Actually, that was Sabuza. I was content to take the stairs. He replied. So, what do we all think? May asked as she placed the Kubikiribocho on the side of the chair, making it lean. 
That Suijetsu kid wasn't bad with the Kubikiri Bocho. Anoki commented. And he used the Mizudepo no Jutsu quite well. But that was all he was good with. Gara objected. Take away those and he didn't have much to use in a fight. His temper also led him into trouble. That such a kid agreed. Speaking of which, what do we think of Saka? Tsunade asked. The kid has been trained by a master, there is no doubt. That's why he commanded the bout. Killer B stated. H he's right. Chojuro agreed, the confidence he had beforehand slowly disappearing. His swordsmanship was a little stiff, but that was it. He displayed some exceptional movements and knew how to use his sword against a larger sword. He also showed tactical thinking when he first attacked. He was testing how and how his opponent would defend. May noted. It's a shame he's not a shinobi, I would have said he earned the right for Chunin rank. Yes, yes, the Hozuki boy was bad and the foreigner was surprisingly good. A said rudely. Let's move on. Hey brother, what's put you in a foul mood? You're acting really rude. B asked him. Damn it B. Stop it with the rapping. Or do you want the iron claw? He asked, raising his left hand. All right, the next match will be Zuko versus Karen. Jinma called out. Will the two candidates come down? Karen looked over at Zuko. She had also thought that the matches with the foreigners would be a walk in the park. But after watching Suajetsa's match, she wasn't so sure. The foreigner wasn't even one of those benders she had been informed about, but her opponent was one. She turned to look at said opponent. He was flexing his fingers, stretching them to the limits and curling them back. Every time he stretched them, a small flame would appear in his hands. Every time he curled them back, the flames would disappear. It was a little unnerving to watch someone be able to use fire so easily without any hand seals whatsoever. What also unnerved her was the fact she couldn't sense any chakra from him or his friend. He turned his gaze on her, and she stiffened. His golden eyes seemed to look right through her. They showed nothing, except someone who would not be holding back in any way. The glare on his face and the scar just help enforce the point. However, she then saw something that terrified her to the bone. Encircling him protectively was a dragon the color of fire. Its bright blue eyes looked at her and promised something worse than death. As he was about to make his way to the sta stairs, she turned to the railing. Proctor, I forfeit. She declared in a loud voice. I withdraw from the match. This got a lot of booing from the audience. Zuko just walked back over to Sokka and Akela. Told you she'd quit. Sokka said with a grin. Yeah, you were right. I'm glad I didn't bet money on like Naruto and Jiraiya. He replied with a smile. The two shared a small laugh while Karen looked at the two. They were betting on whether or not I would forfeit. She asked herself in furious silence. Due to Karen's forfeit, Zuko wins by default. Jinma announced to the arena, getting more boos. The next match will be between Naruto Uzumaki and Yugo. That stopped the booing. Would the two candidates come down? Yugo leapt over the railing and landed on the arena floor. Everyone began to pay closer attention. This was one of the matches they had actually come to see. They wanted to see Naruto in action. However, they still didn't know where he was. Well, where is he? Asked A. Will he show? May asked Tsunade. He will be here. Gara told her. You seem awfully confident about that, Kazekage. Anoki said. I know him well enough. He will be here. You would be right, Gara, except for one thing. Jiraiya said to him. And what would that be? He asked. He won't be here, he's already here. The Toad Sage looked up at the ceiling. Right, Naruto? Yeah, yeah, I hear ya. Naruto's voice spoke from above. 
they heard the sound of feet walking on roof tiles. You know you owe me twenty, right? He frowned at those words I'm well aware of that. Now get your ass down there. He ordered. All they saw was a blur leaping down from the roof. Jiraiya, how long was he there? Tsunade asked him. About two hours before the exam started. Why did no one see him? Matsuri asked. He was counting on the fact that no one really bothers to look up. He landed on the wall, then jumped off of it and landed on the ground. I'm here. He told Genma. So, you are? He replied, looking the blonde over. The zipper on the jumpsuit was pulled down and stopped when it was at his waist. He wore a black sleeveless shirt underneath the shirt and had bandaged his left arm, on the bicep and on the forearm. His jian was slung across his back in its usual manner. All in all, it made him look a little intimidating. If the both of you are ready, then let the match begin. He declared, stepping back. The two stared at each other. Are you going to attack? Or are you just going to stand there? Naruto asked as he pulled out a cigarette and lit it. I do not wish to fight you. Yugo replied, but his body language said different. It screamed about how it wanted to attack. Tough shit, now attack me. The blonde ordered him. I will not. You're afraid of me, aren't you? Yes. Fine, I'll give you a handicap. He put his hands in his pockets. I'll just use my feet. That seem fair to you? He asked his opponent. I still won't fight you. In that case, just stand still. He charged forward and threw a kick at his face, which he caught effortlessly. But it left him open and Naruto took the chance to kick his midsection. He gave a grunt of pain and let go of the foot, clutching his midsection. Please, don't make me do this. Yugo begged. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't aware you had a choice, slave. He spat out the last word like it disgusted him. What? You are a slave. You do not the option of choosing something. A man chooses but a slave obeys. Don't call me that. He said. Call you what? Don't call you a slave? Naruto barked a harsh laugh. You are a slave. You have never chosen. You have only obeyed. I am not a slave. He screamed as he charged forward his skin turning gray and his right arm turning into larger form of itself. What the hell is that Baka thinking? Kiba demanded. He's gonna get pounded into the ground now. And here he had thought that Naruto had gotten smarter over the years. You doubt my ability to train somebody? Jiraiya asked in a fake hurt voice. He knows what he's doing. But Lord Jiraiya, you saw the same thing we did. Hinata said. What'll happen if Naruto gets hit by that arm? I'll punish him later for getting hit. He replied with a completely straight face. Yugo kept swinging his arm, trying hit to Naruto. But all he did in response was either dodge or use a kick to knock his arm aside. I'm disappointed, Yugo. He said. You say you aren't a slave, and yet here you are, obeying. I don't take orders. His opponent shouted, more of his skin turning gray. Oh really, you are certain of that? You're following orders right now. He leaned back to avoid a punch that would have knocked his head off. No, I'm not. Of course you are. Your master has ordered you to kill me and your rage is ordering you to rip me to bloody pieces. Those are orders and you obey them. You are a slave. Yugo roared in anger and swung another punch at him. He dodged effortlessly. And you continue to disappoint me. I am not a slave. I chose to hide myself from everyone. I chose to lock myself away. No, you obeyed what your fears whispered in your ear. That is why you locked yourself away. You're lying. The grotesque arm shrunk back down to a normal size. 
It remained gray, but instead, an axe grew out of his forearm. The same thing happened on his other arm as well. What do you know? You're not just a slave, you're a monster too. Naruto said, simultaneously making it sound like what he saw was something amazing and disgusting. Die. He screamed. I don't believe what my eyes do see. This is something new for the killer bee. Be stated as he watched what happened on the field. I must agree with your brother, Lord Rakage. May told him. She had never seen, seen someone like that before. What is he? Gara wondered aloud. Everyone was wondering that as well, except for the Tsuchikage. It's been a while since I've seen a member of that clan. Anoki said. What are you talking about, old man? Kuratsuchi asked her grandfather, her tone annoyed but also curious. I have fought many people in my life who hail from the same clan as that boy. He told her. They could all do the same things as he can, but they are also struck with the same infection. They are sometimes struck with bloodlust and go berserk. I had to kill more than I would want to count that had destroyed entire villages, and I've always lost men every time it happened. So you've killed every member of this clan? He looked at her. Obviously not, a few must have gone into hiding. What's the name of this clan? Asked A. I didn't have time to ask, I was always a little busy trying to make sure my shinobi didn't die. He kept swinging his axes at his target, but he kept missing. Naruto did not try to attack at all, nor did he remove his hands from his pockets. He would always step back, evaded, or use his legs to kick the attacks away. As he attacked, he got angrier and angrier. More of his skin turned dark, and when it finally came to his eyes, they became yellow and black. He kept on attacking, but he didn't get anything out of it. The longer I look at you, the more I see the slave. Naruto told him coldly. And the more disgusted I am. Shut up. He roared. Why should I? Do you hate listening to the truth so much? His skin had turned completely dark. The nails on his fingers sharpened themselves. His forehead and the sides of his face had turned into a hard bone, and a black ran down from his forehead to the end of his nose. Multiple things began to emerge from his back. The cloak he wore hindered it, so he cast it off. The blue shirt he wore was torn to rags as multiple pipes spewed chirka from them. I'm gonna kill ya. He declared with maniacal laughter. Try if you can, slave. Naruto simply replied. Laughing like a crazed man about to die, he charged forward, his speed increasing. He shot towards Naruto, axes at the ready. He was faster than before, but Naruto was still able to dodge them. He stopped, immediately turned around, and leapt for his back. He swung around and threw a roundhouse kick at the outstretched hands. The hands caught the leg and slammed it into the ground. He pulled his hands out of his pockets and reached out to the ground. When they touched it, he yanked his foot free and rolled forward. Yugo swung his axes down at his back, trying to cleave him in half. He continued rolling to avoid them. He then leapt up out of the roll and turned back around to face him, his hands back in the pockets. Is that all? He asked. Not even close. Yugo charged forward again only to stumble and fall when he felt the same immense killing intent coming from the blonde directed at him. Do you think this will stop me? I'm gonna to get back up and then I'm gonna kill ya. He declared, looking him in the eye. That will depend. Naruto replied. Depend on what? He asked, trying to stand up. Are you going to kill me as a man, or as a slave? What do you mean? Killing is killing. Are you a man, or are you a slave, Yugo? The blonde asked him, still keeping him pinned with the killing intent. I am not a slave. He answered, his voice switching back and forth between the crazed tone and his normal one. But are you a man? No, I'm a monster. Answer the question, Yugo. Naruto shouted at him. Are you a man, or are you a slave? 
Neither. He screamed back. Wrong. Wrong. The fire paragon bellowed. A man chooses, but a slave obeys. Which one are you? I don't know. Then decide. Will you submit to your feelings of rage and follow your master's orders? Or will you choose to stop fighting? I didn't want to fight in the first place. But you still would have. You were going to follow your master's orders to kill me. You did not realize that you were a slave. He walked closer to him, keeping the killing intent on him. A man chooses, but a slave obeys. Will you choose, or will you obey? He reached down and grabbed him by the shirt, lifting him up until they were face to face. Are you a man, or a slave? He roared. I'm a man. Yugo roared back in his normal voice. Then prove it. Naruto released his grip and stepped back, the killing intent vanishing. If you are a man, choose to quell your rage. He stayed there on his knees, concentrating. The pipes and axes slowly began to shrink back into his body. Every couple of seconds, it looked like they were struggling to stay out. Eventually, they disappeared into his body. Then his skin began to change back. The dark skin would sometimes struggle to stay in place, but it would be pushed back. In the end, Yugo sat on his knees in a tattered shirt and ragged shorts. There was no dark skin showing, his arms did not hold any axes, and he did not wear a crazed grin on his face. Well. What are you? Naruto asked him. He stood up on shaky legs. I am a man, not a slave. He answered in a clear voice. I do not obey, I choose. And I choose to forfeit. Oh no, no, we cannot have that, Yugo. A voice said as someone landed next to him. It was a man with ash-gray hair and glasses covering onyx eyes. Both his pants and his shirt were purple, while his undershirt was white. He wore a white cloth waistband and blue sandals, as well as a shuriken holster on his right leg. You have your orders. Kill Naruto Uzumaki. I won't do it, Kabuto. I am not a slave. He replied. You see, that's where you're wrong. You are a slave. And if you won't obey, then you'll be forced to obey. He quickly pulled out a syringe and aimed it to plunge it into Yugo's neck. The syringe was knocked out of his hand by a shuriken and fell to the ground, the glass shattering on impact. He jumped back to avoid a kick. You've grown up, Naruto. He said to the blonde. You're still the same, Kabuto, a complete smug, insufferable asshole. He replied. He grabbed Yugo and pushed over to the proctor. Get him out of here, Genma. He told the shinobi. Jinma nodded and took hold of Yugo before leaping away. As he leapt away, Zuko, Sokka and Akela leapt into the arena and ran to back Naruto up. You brought friends. Kabuto noted. And you brought none. Who is this man? Zuko asked Naruto. This is Kabuto Yakushi, second in command to Orochimaru, the leader of Odogekure and traitor to Kanoha. He introduced the man standing before them. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Kabuto gave them a mocking half-bow. Speaking of the bastard, where is he? I am right here, Naruto. A sinister voice spoke in the air. Then, out of the ground, a man appeared. He slowly rose up until he stood next to Kabuto. Both Sokka and Zuko recoiled slightly when they saw him. His skin was very pale, almost to the point of pasty. His waist-length hair was black. His eyes were amber and had slits in his pupils. Purple markings surrounded his eyes. He wore black pants and a black polo neck with a gray garb over it. Around his waist was a thick, purple rope belt that was tied off in the back. He wore blue tomo-shaped earrings on his ears with a whimsical, if not a little sinister smile on his face. Face. This guy is giving me the creeps just by looking at him. Sokka thought to himself. Ha, huh, who would have thought he'd show up? Kisame asked. 
It's his home village and the QB Jinchuriki is back. I guess he was interested too, HM. Daydara said. Whoa, is that really Orochimaru? Toby asked, sounding both surprised and amazed. Yeah, that's the pasty bastard all right. Hayden answered. I still want to send him to Lord Jashin. What he tries to do is blasphemy. You can't attack him, Hayden. Kakuza told him. You think I don't know that? Stop, Conan ordered them. We will do nothing. We are simply here to observe, nothing more. Right now, we're under diplomatic immunity. If we lose that, then the five Kages will have an excuse to attack us. Is that understood? Yes. They all answered. What in the hell? Asked A, completely surprised by the fact. Orochimaru's here? We can see him quite well. May remarked with a little sarcasm. Lady Tsunade, what are you going to do? Gara asked the Hokage. She simply raised her hand and touched the wireless radio she wore around her neck. Activate. She ordered. So, you've finally shown yourself. Naruto said, his tone of voice even and controlled. He had been waiting three years for a chance like this to show itself. But he had to stay in control of himself to take advantage of it. I think I should be the one saying that. Orochimaru replied. You disappeared for three years and now, all of a sudden you're back. It was an opportunity one couldn't resist. To capture an experiment on me to see what I could do and if you could copy my abilities? Precisely, not to mention your new friends as well, he answered with a, sadi a sadistic grin, making Zuko, Sokka, and even Akela shudder. I take it you all were brought in kicking and screaming. More like knocked out. The blonde replied. I was planning on getting us all out, but they offered me a deal sweet enough to make me stay. And what was that? The chance to kill you, he answered with a straight face. A dark chuckle escaped the pale man's lips. Amusing, Naruto, very amusing, he said with a malicious grin. I would offer you the chance to try, but I and my subordinates must leave now. A smirk appeared on his face at those words. You haven't noticed yet, have you? Noticed what? Did you really think your former teammates wouldn't know what you were planning? They knew what you were going to do long beforehand and prepared accordingly. He pulled out a shuriken and threw it up into the air. Once it reached a certain point above the arena, it hit a wall of energy. As the energy rippled, revealing the dome over the arena, the shuriken fell back down to the ground. A simple cage seal, reinforced five times over. He stated. There's no way you'll be able to get out easily. Oh, and by the way. He pointed up to the waiting area. I don't think your subordinates will be joining you. Orochimaru looked at the waiting area, letting nothing show on his face. He knew the cage seal enclosed a certain area, both in the air and underground. If you were powerful enough and knew what to do, it was very easy to break the seal. But when the seal was reinforced, its strength and resilience grew. The more reinforced it was, the more it grew and the harder it was to break it. He also knew that if Karen was not in the waiting area, then both she and Suijetsu had been taken, along with Yugo. But he wasn't annoyed, angry, or even embarrassed. If anything, he looked inter interested. I guess I really should have known better. He admitted as he turned to look up at the Kage box. Well played, Tsunade, Jiraiya. He called up to his old teammates with a mocking salute. He turned his attention back down to Naruto. I guess I can entertain you after all, Naruto. A deal's a deal, right? He flashed through two hand seals. Sanaijishu, hidden shadow snake hands. He held out his right hand in a punching motion as snakes emerged from the sleeve and flew towards their enemies. Back up. Naruto told the others. They jumped away as the snakes smashed into the ground where they just were. They landed further away from the two. The two groups stood on different sides of the arena, staring each other in the eye. If I am going to fight you, 
then I might as well make it interesting. I was saving this one for a special occasion, and I guess this would be it. He looked over at Kabuto. Do it. He ordered. Yes, Lord Orochimaru. He flashed those hand seals at an incredible pace and slammed his hands into the ground. Kuchios, Edo Tensei, Summoning, Impure World Reincarnation. A coffin rose up out of the ground and stood in front of him. Are you ready to face your opponent, Naruto? He asked the blonde. I can almost guarantee you won't be able to fight this person. The coffin lid fell down to the ground and the person inside stepped out. While Saka and Zuko were confused about who it was, Naruto kept a straight face. Inside his mind was a different story. He didn't. The Kyuubi said in shock. He knew that his Jinchuriki and his teammates had been briefed on the technique. But the person in front of them was not someone the fox was expecting. Apparently, he did. Naruto silently answered, a little surprised. I didn't think he'd be that heartless. Kisame admitted as he looked down at the person standing in front of Orochimaru and Kabuto. Ha! Huh. Who was that? Toby asked curiously. That's someone who is well known in this village. Kakuzu answered. When she was alive, the bounty on her head was fairly impressive. That's all you can think about, money. Haydn remarked. What do you think about this, Itachi, home? Daydara asked him. When he didn't answer, they all looked at him. He was visibly angry, something they thought he would never show on his face and trembling with fury. How dare he do that? He asked with a growl. Who is that person? May asked. I don't know. Gara answered. Is that who I think it is? Anoki asked Tsunade. She didn't answer, she didn't have to. The fact that both she and Jiraiya looked absolutely dangerous and leaking large amount of killing intent was enough of an answer. Damn you, Orochimaru. Jiraiya roared from the railing down at the field. Have you no shame? Lord Jiraiya, why are you so angry? Hinata asked. Yeah, just who is that person? Aang asked as well. Is she someone important? Suki asked. He turned to look at them. He didn't just summon anyone back from the dead. He summoned Kushina Uzumaki. Kushina Uzumaki? Kiba repeated. Is she from the same clan as Naruto? She's his mother. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.